Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto found out about the Uzumaki clan and was a prodigy. A small twist of fate made him aware of his heritage, unsealing the legacies his parents left behind. Graduating from the academy at age 7, he's well on his way. He found a kindred spirit in Uchiha Itachi, and his cousin Shisui is along for the ride. They're on the path to unsealing the legacy left by their ancestors, both the dark and the light. Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 14, 14th Legacy Sarutobi Hiruzen wondered if he should feel relieved or grow even more anxious with how Naruto returned from his mundane C-rank mission unmolested. The Umbu team that he dispatched to follow them reported that Naruto and his team had performed their mission to the letter. Despite the fact that hundreds of Naruto's cage bunshin was seen running around all over N.A. no Kuni for days, there have been no reports of any suspicious activity. He found that Naruto even made time to share some of the seals he made to irrigate his garden, offering them at a discounted rate on the promise that they kept hiring Kanahan in for missions. Apparently some of the farmers there were forced to use labor-intensive methods because they had no money to put up a proper irrigation system for their fields, Naruto's seals offered a cheaper alternative to that. It seemed that Naruto made a killing in the said agricultural country. It was actually the fact that the mission was almost uneventful that made him anxious. Naruto was still the same dutiful young shinobi, and his reports are as concise and enlightening as usual. He even added a suggestion to propose a deal with N.A. no Kuni that may allow Kanaha to monopolize D and C rank missions for the maintenance of their farms. The fact that N.A. no Kuni was just a day's trip from Kanaha, makes it perfect for new teams to train for working in another country while still remain relatively safe. In response, Sarutobi promised that he'll write a letter to N.A. no Kuni's lord as soon as possible. Naruto seemed elated by the prospect, since it seemed that the boy has fallen in love with N.A. no Kuni's people during his stay. The Sandaime didn't have the heart to inform him that N.A. no Kuni's peace is just a facade. At the heart of its court, the Daimyu is actually on the verge of being ousted by a group of criminals sponsored by treacherous courtiers. He would have had to send a team to save the Lord of N.A. no Kuni if only to ensure that such a deal brings prosperity for Kanaha. Unfortunately the Daimyu has not agreed to the proposal, citing that there's no reason to spare his shinobi for charity. The benefits of the proposal was found to be too small for the risks that sending a team might incur. And his advisors would never approve of this just to make Naruto happy. A shinobi village is first and foremost, a business, and no one performs charities without profits in their world. So with heavy a heart he dismissed Naruto with a promise he knows he'll never fulfill. He didn't even think twice about approving Naruto's request for taking leave from duty for a few days to prepare for his next ranking exam as a SEAL master. He had no doubt that Naruto will pass, and he hoped that this would help serve as a distraction to help the boy forget about N.A. no Kuni. The Sandai man never noticed the way Naruto's eyes gleamed with determination the moment his back was turned nor how his lips silently mouthed. Preparations complete. Tower of Seals, few into. It was not his favorite place in the tower, no matter how much Naruto claims to love this little rooftop garden. While he may have called it little, he didn't mean it as literally. It's just how Naruto named this place, a circular greenhouse around 15 feet in diameter and filled with various plants and flowers. It was, Naruto's little garden, at least, that's how the boy named it. As for why it was not his favorite place, it's simply because of the fact that he was a censor. While he cannot claim that he's one of the best out there, even he can feel the pressure in the air that a sensor experiences in areas that are highly saturated with nature chakra. It's like swimming in a pool of oil, as if there is something oily and slimy clinging to your senses. It was a very uncomfortable sensation to say the least. He was aware that Naruto was developing a knack in sensing chakra, and he wonders how the blonde can stand it at all. He glanced at the boy who was once again thoroughly soaking the seals all around the greenhouse with his chakra. Naruto was pouring an insane amount of chakra as usual to maintain this garden, and at the rate he was going this place would be as rich as the rumored Mount Miyabaku in terms of nature chakra in few years. All done. Naruto said as he stepped back from the seal array. That will hold up for a week at least. Itachi who was also watching the seal work keenly couldn't help but comment, you have been feeding your plants with chakra for so long, while turning the energy to nature chakra. 
basically creating a rich nature chakra saturated soil. Shisui continued, the Hokage will flip if he finds out about this secret side project of yours. Naruto shrugged, caressing a thick vine gently and was pleased to feel it twitch under his caress. He was no Senju Hashirama, but his project was going well enough to be considered a success. What is the issue? It's mine, I am not hurting anyone with it, and it's not dangerous as far as I know. It's mine. The moment Naruto said that, any chance of him relinquishing this little garden of his became non-existent. If there was one thing the Uchiha cousins have learned about Naruto, was that of his utter possessiveness of things that he claimed as his own. Itachi would always remember the way Naruto clung so protectively to his ceiling notes when they first met. Then again. Naruto was a child denied so many things for so long because of his Jinchuriki status. He has taken to caring for plants ever since he was small to keep himself company, and because of the fact that he could give them all attention he wanted and no one would get angry or lecture him about it like they did when he tried to take in a stray cat. Well, not even the Hokage has seen this garden ever since it transformed into a nature chakra fountain. Itachi admitted, he will have a heart attack if he finds out that the five little potted plants you got back then have become like this. E, really? Naruto mused as rested on a giant lotus leaf floating on a sizable pond of his garden. Nah. I think Hokage-sama would be more shocked if he knew about what I am going to do next. Shisui shuddered. Is it too late to convince you to change your mind? Like hell I will stop now. Naruto hissed angrily, I won't and I can't. There's no way he will stop now, Shisui. Itachi reminded the older Uchiha. We are at the point that we have no choice but to continue in moving forward with our plans or risk everything falling apart. Shisui sighed wearily, it's always do or die for us huh? Of course death would be more preferable if ever they fail since in this case they would not only lose their lives but something worse. Hmm. <laughs> Naruto hummed, finding it mildly humorous how calm he felt after experiencing this kind of situations far too many times to count. But you see. I couldn't help but feel excited of the things to come. He said as he raised his hand as if to reach out to the sky beyond the glass dome. Everything will change soon. It's unfortunate that it has to be this way. Shisui couldn't help but say. Itachi snorted at that. Don't say it like that. He closed his eyes, a chick could only be born by breaking the shell of its egg, the very shell that once protected it. Shisui gritted his teeth at that, but Itachi. It seemed Itachi was already singing a different tune, the way his cousin was speaking. Itachi was against this as much as he did before but now. This is the only way, huh? But still. Naruto hummed a playful tune, his hand was still reaching out. From the small gaps between his fingers the sunlight filtered into a thin thread. Any. Karama, do you think changing the world is possible, dot? Yeah, remember that the Sage of Six Paths did change the world back then, but I am not confident of the odds that a mere child like you could do it. Karama said, snickering in the deepest part of his mind. The Uchiha cousins were startled to hear Naruto suddenly laughing from his napping place, it seemed that Karama said something that amused him again. Sometimes they wished they could hear the two converse, they felt out of the loop sometimes. A mere child like me can't change the world. Naruto exclaimed as he rolled around on the giant lotus leaf. True so true, but you see. He was laying on his stomach, crossing his arms as his eyes locked to his friends. Together I think we can do it. Right guys? With you by my side, we can do everything. Shisui grinned at that, of course. Itachi just sighed before he replied, true. As he watched Shisui tackle Naruto leading to both of them sinking the lotus leaf under their weight, he couldn't help but feel content. For so long he was haunted by the shadow of the third shinobi war, by the image of blood and tragedy. Ever since he learned of his clan's ambition, their foolish pride that blinds them from the world around them, he almost felt consumed by the fear of another war. He would then be forced to choose between his clan and village. Perhaps he and Shisui would have done something they'd regret, if that's what they had to do for. The water is nice. My pond is not a pool for you to cool down, idiot. Naruto said as he landed a playful punch on Shisui's face. But because of Naruto, it was strange that ever since Naruto entered his life, his despair and doubts were soothed. He could believe that one way or another if it's Naruto, 
he would be able to do something to make everything all right. Naruto would be there for them, the same way they would for him. Oh before I forget. Naruto who was soaked to the bone rummaged his pockets and threw something round and black at each of them. That's the thing I was talking about few weeks ago, it's done. Itachi caught the black object or rather at the deep red almost borderline black stone. Shisui caught his, and was observing the pendant curiously. Not that I'm doubting you or anything since it's common sense to ask, is this safe? Naruto nodded, it is. I am pretty sure it won't combust on your faces at least. Oh. Shisui rolled his eyes, that's nice. Just trust Naruto in this. Itachi deadpanned as he putting the pendant on. It's one you made especially for us, any. He nodded, I attuned it to your chakras, but as I said it's just in preparation for things to come. You don't have to worry about using it so soon. Shisui craned his neck. But the problem is not really a problem if it we can make it come at us when we want it. According to the information network of the Shiamitsu, it won't be. Naruto assured him. We are as alert as we could be for now. We trust you. Itachi muttered. We always will. Naruto smiled softly, thank you. That's the reason they're still going through with this risky plan, because they believed in each other. A few days later, N.A. no Kuni's forest. His eyes narrowed predatorily at his target, a lean and long-haired man. Ruga, the water user. He whispered as he unsheathed his blade. Ruga was a formidable Sutton user, and he was known to use dowsing to spot for water sources, extracting it from earth and manipulating it airborne to great effect. Though even if he was a formidable as Sutton user, his overall skill as shinobi was another matter entirely. This man could be classified as one of those over-specialized shinobi who relies on their trump skills too much to the detriment of ignoring their development in everything else. It won't be an easy task going against him, but with careful calculations and a swift execution it could be. As easy as turning the back of his hand, his target followed him like a starving predator. All it took was a little goading from his part and Ruga left the safety of numbers to his pursue his death. Then again he could not imagine the other two brothers coming for this fool's rescue. Ruga came to an abrupt halt upon noticing the four tags he had placed on the trees in a square formation, laughing haughtily and not even bothering to move from the death trap. You think such a basic trap could kill me? A standard Fubuku Hojin. The Fubuku Hojin is a trap so called for an array of explosive tags placed around an area that can be detonated with a hand seal while also being sensitive to the proximity of any who enters the enclosed area. Should the trapped opponent attempt to move, the tags explode. Since the target was unable to move lest he risk being blown to bits, it was a perfect supplementary technique to subdue an opponent. It was however a basic technique that almost any shinobi above Chunin level won't be caught dead on, not without having another trap layered on top of it. He could tell what Ruga had in mind, he could extract water from the earth without moving a muscle and use it as shield to absorb the blast. However what Ruga didn't notice was the tags that were placed far above his line of sight, in the the branches above the very same trees. Four tags with kanji on its seal array center. The moment Ruga enacted his plan, the seal's sensor arrays triggered by the presence of dense water natured chakra in the air went off and fried the water user shinobi. <laughs> Ruga let out his last scream as high voltage electricity tore through his body. His assassin didn't even bother to listen to his howls of agony and moved on to his next target. Leaving four clones to confirm Ruga's death and to inspect the body. Hitosu, 1. Another letter of challenge issued, and neither Jiga nor Rengo lamented the death of their youngest brother. Get rid of this pest, or I will personally kill you myself. Rengo warned his brother. Jiga swallowed, yes. They still had to kill those benefactors who had sponsored this coup and until then they had not completely conquered this country. Jiga had no delusions that Renga alone could conquer this country without him. A smile curved up Tha Assassin's lips as Jiga left Renga and departed into the depths of the forest, just like Ruga did. Jiga, the user of magnetism. He whispered to no one. The second brother was known for his magnetic abilities in spite of not hailing from a magnet user clan of Kumogakur. According to the intelligence they gathered, the ability came from his consumption of iron since an early age. Jiga made his body to adapt with his unique diet that resulted in him gaining control over magnetism. 
however forcing his body to do that would gave him a glaring weakness. Apparently he couldn't turn it on and off by will but by slapping his stomach, and he had to turn it off after an extended use or he risks losing control of his ability. It would be easy to exploit this weakness like Ruga's but the problem was, unlike Ruga, Jiga had the physical prowess to back him up and was extremely proficient with his Kyuzaragama. He was not going to be as easy. With that in mind the assassin hurled a barrel of exploding kunai towards the magnet user. That won't work. Jiga shouted as he used iron sand to form a shield. We will see. The voice was mischievous, echoing trough the dark forest hauntingly. Jiga was not a coward but the voice was unnervingly playful, as if it was enjoying watching him squirm under relentless explosive attacks. Jiga won't give in and squirm for his attacker, however under the continuous assault he started to squirm as he had to keep ability for too long and eventually had to stop. Jiga threw the biggest shield he could make and quickly abandoned his cover after it exploded, turned his ability off, and took out his weapon. If the assassin thought he would stay idle and fall for this meager tactic, the bastard had another thing coming. The attacks were relentless but so far it had only been coming from one general direction, which meant that it's very likely there's only one assassin. As long as he takes care of the bastard, he wouldn't have to fear an ambush and advance as he liked. Jiga grinned as he spotted a shinobi dressed in a standard uniform, a vest, long-sleeved shirt and pants, and the man was holding a kunai. Jiga was a frontal assault type of fighter but he could do stealth if he puts his mind into it. He threw his Kyuzaragama to the defenseless shinobi, only for his Kyuzaragama to turn its target to smoke. Jiga never saw the powerful wind blade coming from behind and he hollered in pain. Both of his hands were cut off and the last blade of wind tore his back forming a long gash. Jiga was barely conscious when he bled to his death. The target's hands were cut off to prevent him from turning on his magnetism, a little overkill but better than sorry. Fyutatsu, too. The last one was Renga and he didn't rush for the last brother, content on watching Renga throw a tantrum and unleash his fury on the greedy and disloyal courtiers of this country. Who was he to stop a criminal from murdering their kin and save himself from extra work? Besides, Renga won't let himself engage the assassin who had killed his brothers in the dead of night. Renga in spite of being a shinobi, actually had a better advantage when fighting in broad daylight. If he wanted Renga to come out with the same arrogance and ignorance like the other two brothers did, he had to call Renga out first thing tomorrow morning. Renga didn't disappoint as the eldest brother retraced his deceased brother's path to their deaths while accepting his challenge. Futon no Jujiakafun, Wind Element Cross Seal The brown-haired shinobi didn't bat an eye as his transparent barrier blocked the chakra-enhanced shuriken, frowning when he heard a high-pitched screech from his shield. Che. He grunted in annoyance. His ice was as hard as diamond, and while it could stop almost anything, apparently a wind element attack could make a crack on it. Fortunately it was not enough to pierce his ice and injure him. Deep in the forest, hiding in the midst of lush trees and vegetation, the assassin observed his target keenly. Out of the three brothers, Renga was the one whose technique he didn't get the secret of. There was an invisible barrier as the reports said, but when his shuriken hit the said barrier he could see the crack lines form on it. Some sort of glass or the likes, but that hardness was like a diamond's. It was unlikely for it to be actual diamond though since one of the reasons Renga staged a coup in this country was for his lack of wealth. Hmm. <laughs> a feral voice whispered to him, and his lips curved up to a mischievous smile. I see, in that case he is no longer a mystery to me. He murmured. Renga narrowed his eyes when a child walked out to the clearing he occupied. The child had his hands folded on his back, a serene smile on his face as he stopped roughly ten feet away from Renga. The older shinobi didn't move, not even an ounce of his being felt threatened by the child. What are you doing here, brat? There was no answer from the child, but the moment the child unsheathed his blade, Renga knew the answer. You came to kill me. Once again the child's action was enough an answer as a giant wind blade tore its path towards him. For the first time, Renga felt threatened as he rushed to raise his ice shield. Just like before a hairline crack formed on his supposedly indestructible shield. Renga felt his blood rushing to his head, and he wanted nothing but to wring the brat's little neck. On second thought he'd rather see the brat burn. With that in mind, Renga jumped to the air and landed on a disc he formed. But instead of seeing fear on the boy's eyes, 
he saw nothing but fascination and curiosity. In fact the boy was just standing there outright staring at him. Die. He had decency to look sheepish as an invisible beam struck the spot he occupied few seconds ago, melting the ground. So not the time to be distracted by observing Renga's technique. It was easy to dodge the attack because while Renga had a Jounin's speed, his attacks rely on nature, therefore so as long as he could tell where's the missing Nin was aiming the attack could be dodged. If Renga thought he was the only one who could attack, the older shinobi had another thing coming. He faked helplessness as he let himself get a couple of close calls, and Renga in spite of being superior didn't bother to go down from his high throne and content to watch his assassin running around helplessly. So focused in playing with his prey, Renga didn't even bother to look up. He only noticed something was wrong the moment the dot of light on the ground, the focus of his ice lens suddenly disappeared. He looked around and up as veil of endless white descended on him. Rengel looked around in panic as the ground below also covered in veil of mist, and he completely lost sight of his surroundings. Kirigaku or no jutsu? He hissed. True. A mischievous voice echoed through the air, and Renga tried to look for the source of the voice but it sounded as if it come from every direction. While I am no master of this jutsu, overloading it with chakra made the mist become very thick and heavy. Renga gritted his teeth raising his hand to expand the lens he occupied but nothing happened. Why? His eyes widened when numerous chains suddenly sprung and tied his body in its iron hold, and he struggled to keep standing on his disc. It's wasting a lot of chakra but with how dense my chakra is in the air it's now impossible for you to imbue it with your own to shape that fancy disc of yours, or at least with your chakra capacity you won't be able to overpower mine. The amused voice said, you may be a jonin level in terms of power but because of your arrogance you fell to my trap just like your brothers. You. What do you want? Renga gritted out in anger, struggling to get out of his bind. Soten Jinseyun, sky clouded in silver stars. With no means to protect himself and no way of dodging the incoming attack, Renga could only watch as the endless white mist was torn by a torrent of wind that enveloped him in the embrace of its vortex. He was pulled in, screaming and kicking and the next thing he knew he was on the ground with cuts and bruises marring his body. He struggled to stand up but his body didn't obey. The sharp pain on his back told him that his back was bleeding and his stinging shoulder was a sign of a broken bone. The boy approached him but Renga couldn't even lift even a finger as the sharp blade cut through his blue shirt, exposing the device he had carefully hidden beneath. My, what is this little toy you are hiding Renga-san? The boy asked as placing a tag on his jugular and he could feel his whole body numbed. He couldn't even twitch, he was crippled from his neck down. You, who are you? He hissed venomously, hurling curses towards the boy. The tip of the gleaming blade on his neck didn't unnerve him at first, but suddenly he could feel the blade heat up and started to pulse like a breathing heartbeat. It as if he had his neck on a jaw of vicious beast, not cold steel. Losers don't get to ask Renga-san. The boy knew his name, while he didn't know the boy. From the beginning he was charging blindly to this battle, while the boy did not. Cuh. He grunted. Well then. I'd like you to answer a few questions, and depending on your cooperation, perhaps, you will not be reuniting with your brothers anytime soon. The boy promised. Renga wanted to scream that he didn't want pity but he found himself saying in hoarse voice. A loser doesn't deserve to live. As the strong triumphs over them, ask your questions and this dying man will answer you honestly with his last breath. I don't need your pity, kill me as you see fit as I am a weakling who didn't deserve to live any longer. Is that so? The brat asked, for once there's a tint of sadness in his voice. That's your Nindo, huh? Renga just grinned as his eyes gleaming in madness. Yes, it's my Nindo. Mitsu, 3. A few hours later. Wakaba Inari had been pacing within the safe house non-stop in hopes that he could somewhat lessen his nervousness. Of course it didn't work well as his mind kept going back to the child and his squad mates who had saved him few days ago. It was a close call, and his country would have fallen to the hands of those criminals if not for those shinobi. He had written that letter of request to the Tower of Kanaha, in hopes that the Uzumaki clan still remembers their debt to N.A. no Kuni and help this country. It was his last hope and frankly he had expected the letter to be returned by Kanaha because there's no longer any Uzumaki left in Kanaha. He would have asked Kanaha, 
but his poor country couldn't afford hiring their shinobi for this kind of mission. Their money had been taken over by corrupt nobles and the three brothers, so his only hope rests on the Uzumaki clan that would help them in light of their old friendship and debt. Unexpectedly God hadn't abandoned him, or rather Uzumaki clan had not. He received a reply that requested him to hire Kanaha Shinobi for a C-rank, which he still could afford with his meager savings. In the letter that was written in code his family learned years ago from the Uzumaki clan, he was instructed to hire Kanaha Shinobi as a cover mission to infiltrate his country. As expected those traders didn't even bat an eye as a group of young ninja came to help their farmers to harvest their crops. He had chosen a correct timing too, as during that time those traders were busy counting their earnings collected from the recently raised taxes, and could care less of a squad of shinobi in the country. He was baffled when the youngest shinobi he believed shouldn't even be on the field but in the academy sneaked out of work and came to him. He thought the boy was a messenger, but apparently the boy was the one tasked to rescue him and replace him with a double. He was grateful to be saved from regicide, but he was more worried of what will become of his people in his absence. The shinobi then assured him that as long as he was alive, he could deal with the aftermath and save his country when he retakes his place as their king. He was shocked when the boy introduced himself as the current head of the Uzumaki clan, and apparently the last one in Kanaha. I am Uzumaki Naruto, the clan head of the Uzumaki, as our contract decreed we would never abandon our allies until our last breath. Rest assured Lord Wakaba, soon we will free your country from their subjugators. He didn't want to entrust something this heavy to a child, because sacrificing another child after what he had done to his harina was the last thing he wanted to do. But once again there's nothing he could do, he didn't have a choice as he accepted that child's hand and sent him to his battle. Today was the promised day the boy said, apparently he needed to return first and report about his C-rank mission to Hokage. Last night the boy had returned to N.A. no Kuni, only to ask for his blessing before running off to his battle. The boy promised to return at the latest this afternoon, but the sun almost gone and there's no sign of the boy yet. He dreaded the worst and hoped with all his being he had not just sent a child to death. It took all his strength to not stumble the moment he heard five rhythmical knocks, a sign that the one on the door was his ally. He opened the door and never felt so relieved when he saw the bright golden hair of Uzumaki Naruto. Lord Wakaba, I have. Wakaba didn't let Naruto finish as the daimyo pulled the stunned boy to his arms, you're alright. I am so glad. What was I thinking to send a child to those criminals? Naruto gently pulled himself from the gentle hug, Lord Wakaba. Naruto smiled warmly, I am a shinobi, and an Uzumaki, don't see me as a child, I come in the name of my clan and my nindo. Please acknowledge that, as I have fulfilled my clan's promise to you. He said sternly, leaving no room for argument. Wakaba swallowed, it took him few seconds until what Naruto said sank in. I am sorry Uzumaki-ku. I mean Uzumaki Dono, well I. He stood up, dusting non-existent dust from his kimono, then paused. Does that mean, my country, is saved? He nodded, yes, in fact I even paid your palace a visit and did a little sweeping through your military ranks and servants. Naruto explained the reason of his tardiness. They're all loyal to you and regret not being able to help you my lord, and I ensured it's safe to return to your palace. After he warded the palace as secure as possible, of course, it would be a moot point if Wakaba is assassinated after he went through so much trouble saving the lord. Not to mention Wakaba was one of few kind and gentle souls he thought could only be found in fairy tales, apparently someone like Wakaba did exist. Kindness and foolishness kinda overlaps as a rule in this violent world, but he'd rather have this naive lord to live a long life and be reunited with his daughter. You're getting sentimental. And? It won't hurt me and to have this kind of man on my side is nice. I don't need to fear him betraying me. Is that so? But you fave to dread what the naive lord going to put himself into for the sake of his country, yeah no, I can imagine him throwing himself to invaders to save his people. Karama pointed, he didn't get the concept that if the king dies, the country is bound going to fall sooner or later. Naruto ignored Karama ranting on his head, most of the time he will listen to Karama but sometimes Karama's rants had to be tuned out to keep his focus. Beside he knew the consequences of making someone like Lord Wakaba as his ally. Now all he needed to do was to keep building more connections, and soon it won't be impossible to free Wakaba Harina. 
Being a hostage for so long the princess would have developed a better common sense than her father, and if he play his cards right, he could help N.A. no Kuni to prosper and more. It's going to be a win-win situation for both N.A. no Kuni and his people. Kanaha, two days later. To say that the third Hokage was displeased was an understatement, after all the old Kage didn't give him leave to run off to N.A. no Kuni and make a name for himself by single-handedly killing three Jonin level missing Nin and saving the whole country. The other two elders were unperturbed by the recent development, there's no anger in their body language, just curiosity dosed with skepticism in their expressions. It seemed that they opted to wait and see before deciding their stance in this matter. I am so disappointed in you. Naruto-kun, you lied to me, as one of my shinobi this could count as insubordination to your Hokage. That hurt as expected, but if the Sandaime hoped to guilt trip him with that the old Kage had another thing coming. Hokage-sama. Naruto began, stopping Hakurei on his side from exploding in rage. I did not lie to you. I asked for three days off, no more no less. Sarutobi sighed, you didn't tell me you're going outside of Kanaha, and nothing about hunting missing Nin either. Perhaps you didn't lie, but that doesn't excuse you keeping these kinds of secrets from your superior. As your shinobi, of course. Naruto admitted solemnly, but my actions were not as your shinobi but as an Uzumaki, it's my clan's business with N.A. no Kuni and nothing to do with Kanaha. Naruto-kun, you are the last Uzumaki of the main family. Hakurei cut Sarutobi off, I recall when it comes to clan's internal affairs, that the Hokage has no right to interfere as long as it's not against the well-being of our village. Hakurei reminded the old Kage. It's Naruto-kun's duty as the head of Uzumaki clan and I recall there's been no unwanted casualties in this skirmish so what else do you want? Hiruzen glared at Hakurei balefully, he is too young, his clan affairs is still under my authority. No, it's not. Naruto replied promptly, startling the old Kage. I am a Chunin, while most consider Genin as an adult, the matter of one's clan could be acted on once the clan member becomes a Chunin. Naruto reminded the Sandaime with stern voice, and I am a fourth Dan Seal Master. I have proven myself perfectly capable in saving one of my clan's allies. If hearsay is not enough proof I am more than willing to hand over to you the heads of the three criminal brothers, I am not interested in their bounties. He said as he placed a red scroll before them, neither of them moving to unseal its contents. Mito Kato Homura narrowed his eyes at the scroll, I'm not interested to see their severed heads Chunin Uzumaki. Your willingness to present us this is enough proof that you defeated them and your lack of fear of any investigation attempt in regards to this case. Yudit and Koharu nodded, that aside, while their medium-sized fish in pool of missing Nin, it didn't change the fact that they were considered Jonin level opponents. And you're a Chunin, how impressive. Homura continued, and he could see heroes intensing from the corner of his eyes. I want to say another promotion is in order, but as you pointed out when we promoted you to Chunin, your field experience when it comes to battle is still meager. Kohara sighed wearily, well, with the missions we assigned to you, it's no wonder. She glanced at her Kage meaningfully, so regretfully we have to say that you're not ready to be a Jonin yet. Naruto nodded, that was not what he wanted anyway. Thank you Kohara-sama, I am well aware I'm not ready to be a Jonin. I am still inexperienced. No one missed the way Naruto's voice drop at the last word, I see though I have to say I can't ignore the fact that you're capable of taking down three Jonin. Naruto shook his head, three Jonin, one at a time when they're at their weakest by exploiting their weaknesses and ignorance because of their perceived superiority, it's not a fair fight. He elaborated the circumstances. In a straightforward fight, the three brothers would have beaten him. Of course with Kurama's help he would have beaten them but that was not shinobi-like. We're shinobi, we are never fair. Homura corrected. Naruto nodded in agreement, I concur honored elder. I am merely want to make it clear that my victory over them is result of carefully planned strategy and not mere physical strength. He was trying to gain their recognition, and if he had to flaunt himself, so be it. Kohara's eyes narrowed, a gleam of interest on her eyes. In spite of the fact that this battle is not a sanctioned mission from Kanaha, would you mind to submit a report of how you defeated them? Bingo. Naruto smiled at them, hook, line and sinker. Of course honorable elders, in fact I have it with me now. 
he said as he pulled another scroll from his pocket. Just in case, after all information on missing Nin is always valuable. You've prepared for this. Sarutobi noted, narrowing his eyes at Naruto. Of course no one was fooled that Naruto had the report written by chance, the young shinobi wanted them to read it. To be honest the elders didn't need the scroll to see Naruto had just painted of a billboard of himself as a perfectly capable shinobi that they could use for more than menial tasks their Kage was set on as the only missions available for him. There's also underlying threat in this, that Naruto who was a chunin and in the eyes of Kanaha law already eligible to be recognized as a clan head, he could take missions in the name of his clan as long as it won't endanger Kanaha's interests. Lord Wakaba also requested me as the head of my clan to accompany him in his visit to our daimyo to discuss a new alliance. Naruto informed them with a smile, it will be in 10 days, and I'd like Chunin Itachi and Chunin Shisui to be part of escort, so in this opportunity one also will submit a mission request for the two of them. An rank mission, which would be paid by Lord Wakaba and the Uzumaki clan. No one in the room didn't notice how the three veteran shinobi tensed as Naruto innocently informed them of his plan, as if visiting the Lord of Hinokuni for political reasons was just taking another vacation. They would be blind to not see Naruto was starting to build his political influence as the head of Uzumaki clan, and with his Uchiha friends tagging along, it would seem that Naruto is just dragging his friends for a trip while anyone with the insight can see him actually involving the Uchiha clan as well as part of his political campaign. For the Uzumaki, the old ally and distant relatives of the Senjo to be allied with the Uchiha. The nerve of this boy. For once Koharu and Homura was in the same page as their Kage, they had to stop Naruto or else. Chunin Uzumaki. Homura began, I suggest that you not get ahead of yourself, mind your place boy. Koharu laced her fingers on the top of the table, her eyes never leaving the scroll of mission report and the mission request Naruto just submitted to them. True. While it's impossible for us to not acknowledge the Uzumaki clan. You didn't discredit prestigious and noble clans like the Uzumaki even if they're extinct, not unless Kanaha wanted to tear the spiral on their vests and discard their symbol. Sarutobi could see what his old teammates were trying to get at, although he disliked it he had to admit this was the only loophole they had to exploit. At the rate Naruto was going, he was going to make a terrible mistake. If you keep this up, it would look like you're abusing your position for your own gain Naruto-kun. He pointed out with stern tone, ambition is good and all Naruto-kun, but mind your step before you trip, it's not a very good PR for your clan, in the eyes of our daimyo. If their daimyo had a good head on his shoulders, but unfortunately that's not the case. It's fortunate Hokage had his ears, and Jiraiya too thankfully was fire Damio's favorite so it's easy to maintain a good relationship and steer their lord away from anything that could harm Kanaha and Hai no Kuni. Naruto nodded in agreement, which was unnerving because he was unperturbed by the fact that he had no family members to speak of and accused for being too ambitious for his own sake. True, that won't put my clan in a good light. Naruto said in somber tone. Which is why I am going there on behalf of Lord Wakaba. He beamed with genial smile on his face. In the mission brief, Lord Wakaba requested me as such after all. Sarutobi narrowed his eyes at that, and why should we accept this mission? It's in the mission brief, Hokage-sama. Naruto pointed out. I suggest you take a look of benefits N.A. no Kuni can offer us. He did as suggested with spreading the unrolled scroll on the table so his teammates could read the content too. His eyes almost bulged out of his socket at the list of benefits N.A. no Kuni dared to offer so boldly. They're going to give Kanaha a monopoly over shinobi missions from their country. Kohara read out loud. N.A. no Kuni was a small country but it was an agriculture country, which mean they had lots of menial tasks ranged from D to C that would be perfect for their genin and shinin in training. Naruto nodded, N.A. no Kuni is abundant in exotic crops that couldn't be found in Hai no Kuni, their soil is rich. So they also propose a fair trade with Hai no Kuni. They also agreed to nurture medicinal plants for our needs, farmers of N.A. no Kuni had a knack in domesticating wild plants. He explained and he could see the elders were inwardly salivating on the prospect. Sandaimel looked down at the mission details and then to Naruto. And the only condition Lord Wakaba proposed is for you and your team to be the one who escorts him, which could be seen as reasonable from his view considering you're his savior. Kohara sighed wearily, 
there's not much of a choice, Ardamia would want this alliance and you could only imagine his fury if he knows we made our country pass up this chance. Their lord's fondness of good food was famous, legendary even, and an alliance and good trade with N.A. no Kuni was like early birthday present for him. But still, was it worth it to accept this and dance to their Jinchuriki's tune? They didn't survive until their sixties with naivete, and they'd be a fool to see Uzumaki Naruto as a well-meaning child who only thinks of making people around him happy and having them pay attention to him. That old Uzumaki boy was long gone and has been replaced by this cunning and ambitious young shinobi. The boy wanted to appeal to their daimyo now that his career was hitting a temporary dead end by their Hokage's hand. And he achieved a way to do that just that with this. It's actually not hard for Naruto with his heritage to appeal to the daimyo, his grandfather Muramasa was an exemplary court shinobi in his service period to royal family. In fact it would be more fitting to say Muramasa was thought as a paragon of virtue and was said to be the highest standard a court shinobi like the fire guardians should strive to achieve. His son, Asuma was not amused to find that elegance and being soft-spoken in speech as traits he had to learn to adopt in his service. With his pedigree, appearing before the daimyo with one charming smile would be enough to make the royal family see him as second coming of Muramasa. It won't take much to convince the daimyo to be his benefactor and worse, they could lose Naruto to the daimyo. They couldn't even deny Naruto the right unless they wanted to explain his Jinchuriki status. Naruto. Sandaima began, searching for correct way to snuff this attempt to be a little rebel out. We will consider this for now, after all it's not wise to be hasty. N.A. no Kuni is a peaceful country but their land had long been a bone of contention among the neighboring countries. Homura nodded in agreement, to form a treaty with them would involve protecting this frail country and to spare resource for mere crops to trade is. Naruto unexpectedly didn't even bat an eye when they presented him with a big problem in his plan a waste of human resources from their forces. The boy just nodded in agreement with thoughtful look on his face, true. He concurred, Ardamia will address this problem in the meeting for sure. Sandaime frowned, Naruto-kun. I think we're more inclined to reject this proposal and not bring it up to our lord in light of this matter. He blinked oolishly, bring it up to our lord. He wondered out loud, why do we need to bring it up to him when he already knows and has agreed to it? The three elders gaped at him, looking at the boy incredulously. You did what? Homura gritted out, informing our lord without permission is a serious offense. You have no authority to do such thing. Hakure bristled while Naruto raised his hands in a placating gesture. I won't dare to overstep my boundaries that way, honorable elder. Then again as a shinobi he had ways to skim around that boundary. Lord Wakaba sent a letter via courier ninja, and the meeting is just part of the formalities I suppose. I am not too well versed in how nobles socialize. The last one was a big fat lie, as Naruto probably held the record of being the non-court shinobi with the most missions dealing with nobles. He didn't have the experience meddling in noble politics like court shinobi, but he sure as hell knew how nobles work. But this proposal? Koharu hissed, weren't you the one to propose it? Naruto shook his head, I'm merely a messenger, as I was on the way back to Kanaha I was entrusted to inform you. So they're actually one step behind of Naruto, or was it the lord of N.A. no Kuni? Or perhaps the tower? Hakure? At any rate they had lost this, and Naruto, who was planning this or not was merely a messenger in this whole plot at the time being. There's nothing they could do to stop this unless they wanted to expose too many secrets to their daimyo, and they definitely didn't want the daimyo to find out that the villagers had treated Muramasa's sole grandson and heir terribly. Make sure to prepare well for this mission. He won this round. Ten days later. They're traveling using caravans, and unlike most nobles it was more practical than lavishly furnished. In fact Lord Wakaba was resting on the cart with only a tatami-covered floor a small table and tea set is luxury. Naruto and his teammates were using the cart behind Wakabas, and they were sitting on sacks of rice. Thankfully they're pretty comfortable while leaving guard duty to soldiers and a dozen of clones Naruto left outside. Sai and Shin in the other hand were guarding from the front. I can't believe we did this. Shisui grunted. I mean, with Hokage-sama letting us off for doing this on his back. Naruto sighed wearily, it's not like I'm jumping up and down in excitement either. Just to have this wonderful opportunity took weeks for me to plot. 
He reminded the Shushin expert. And I'm not happy either that I had to call debt on N.A. no Kuni for this. I don't like to use people, even if they get benefits out of it. Itachi nodded in agreement, Hokage-sama and his teammates are going to tread very carefully around you after this. Naruto rolled his eyes, it's not like I have a choice, oh, I have. But that's standing idle and spend my days in bliss of ignorance while our village starts to screw herself. At the solemn look on Itachi's face, Naruto deflated. Sorry. I have been a little stressed lately. Itachi narrowed his eyes, Naruto, you. It seemed that betraying the Sandaima's trust was not as easy as turning the back of his hand as Naruto thought. There's no way Naruto didn't feel guilt at all. I haven't done anything that warrants you to fret over me. Naruto said, rubbing his temple. I am not the twelve-year-old Umbu here. He glanced at Itachi then to Shisui who was decidedly whistling as if nothing was amiss. It's been months since they became Umbu, and that meant their missions were getting even more tasking for the mind and body. Usually Umbu members retired after five years of service, some with unusual circumstances staying longer like Tori's squad. But Tori and his squad stayed that long with guarding him as a permanent mission, which won't drive them insane no matter how hyperactive he used to be. Itachi and Shisui however couldn't afford that privilege when their clan was grasping at straws for their honor and name. Unless Itachi and Shisui can somehow make a name for themselves on the same level as copy ninja Kakashi, something nearly impossible in this relatively peaceful period, they couldn't retire without being ostracized by their clan. Yep, the three of them were stuck between a rock and a hard place. By the way, Shisui as usual was the master of distracting people from gloomy stuff tried changing topics. What are we going to accomplish from this mission, aside from, the mission itself, escorting you and Wakabasama? Naruto swallowed, I am trying to determine how much influence my grandfather has in the royal family and if I can reap its benefits. He admitted hesitantly, showing how much he hated to use his pedigree to get any advantage. Either way I want to try to get in the daimyo's good graces, Currently both your clan and I are under Kanaha's government's authority. So I will make myself have some use for Hai no Kuni and maybe scare the elders a little. Itachi narrowed his eyes, that's very risky, but isn't your pedigree an S-rank secret? Naruto nodded, the daimyo knows so it's not a problem, and he also likes to keep secrets from the Hokage when the needs suit him. That daimyo. Shisui muttered incredulously. That wrinkled old man whose wife unleashed the terror of all genin named Tora. He waved his hand in negative, no no, not that one, I am talking about the real daimyo of Hai no Kuni. Silence fell in the room, as the two Uchiha eyed him with shock. It was comical in Itachi's case as there's lately so little that could surprise the stoic teen. Then again the revelation that the lord they knew was not real or sort of in this case was like turning the world they knew upside down. It was actually not a common knowledge, and was only known by Hokage and his advisors. Hakurei was not supposed to know but his grandfather had the privilege to know the inside of the court and shared that knowledge to Hakurei. Naruto crossed his arms against his chest, sighing wearily. It's not like the daimyo we know. Tokugawa Tekakiyo is completely fake or some sort of body double. He began his explanation, clearing his throat. He is the middle son of previous daimyo after all. Itachi frowned up at that, but didn't you say? That the previous daimyo used Hokuraku Shimon, the fourth Shizaiden to kill his oldest son so the third son could ascend to the throne. He nodded, Itachi had good memory as always. True, the problem is, his youngest and most brilliant son that he favored was 12 years younger than Tekakiyo. He was 13 when the previous daimyo passed away, so naturally Tekakiyo ascended in place of the youngest son. Shisui hummed at that some sort of regent. He waved his hand in negative gesture. No, as I said in spite of his young age Tokugawa Ieyasu is brilliant, so he made his older stepbrother to publicly rule Hai no Kuni in his place, and we all know Tekakiyo is not that bright so he jumped at the chance of his brilliant brother backing him up. Itachi titled his head to the side. In short he is the shadow ruler of Hai no Kuni. At 13. Of course Shisui himself was not one to talk considering he was not much older. Wow, but by now shouldn't he be much older? Why didn't he take the throne himself? Naruto sighed at that, which is why I am worried about dealing with Tokugawa Ieyasu, 
After so many years he is still content using Tekakiyo as politic meat shield. Hakurei said he was fond of my grandfather, but looking at how he used his brother I really doubt it's going to help much. Is Wakabadano going to be okay? He is going to try to establish a trade and alliance with Hinokuni, won't he going to be hoodwinked or something? Shisui asked worriedly, in the short time of knowing the gentle Lord Shisui found the man pleasant and would hate to get the kind man in trouble for their gain. It's just a trade agreement and a minor alliance, there's nothing much to be exploited from a peaceful and small country like N.A. no Kuni. According to Hakure, someone like Ieyasu won't waste his time when there's bigger fish he has to be worried about like Kaminari no Kuni who keeps trying to paw on our lands like their Kumogakur. Naruto assured Shisui. The reason I bring Wakabadano out of numerous lords I am acquainted with for this is because he could propose a good trade and is not threatening enough to Hai no Kuni for Ieyasu to try anything. Itachi sighed, so, you're going to request an audience with him. Not going to go that far, we will see Daimyo Tekakiyo first but for the real one. Naruto trailed off, Ieyasu is so paranoid that only a number of fire guardians know of him. Getting his attention is going to be tough, but if he didn't want to see anyone, well no one has seen him for the last few fears. Shisui frowned, so what are you trying to achieve with? As one the three shinobi tensed, their instincts flared in alarm when they saw Naruto tensing, a sign his clone was relaying information to him. Naruto flinched a little as he felt one of his clones dispel to relay the information. Just mountain bandits. He said as he unsheathed his Hokuto Shishize. If we're lucky, Wakabadano won't know as long as we quickly wrap this up. Shisui sagged his shoulders in relief, Mao. I am almost thought it's rude again. Itachi frowned at his cousin, his hand on the hilt of Tenro. Don't let your guard down. I concur. Naruto narrowed his eyes as he recalled the memory that his clone transferred. There are three leaders in their group. He inclined his head to northwest direction as they stepped out of the cart. Around 100 feet northwest. Number. Around 20 or so. Shisui answered, it's always a pain trying to sense Mukchakra. He frowned. Their number is steadily decreasing. Naruto face palmed, it's Sai. True to his word another ink lion came out of the cart Sai and Shin occupied, along with other animated ink beasts. While it's nice to see him taking initiative instead of waiting for orders unlike he was told in route, he was supposed to wait, now unless the three leaders my clone saw are idiots, they won't be bothering to come out after that spectacle. Shisui frowned at that, true, there goes the chance of some bandit sweeping. He rubbed the back of his head, the request to clean them up is going to Hokage-sama's desk sooner or later anyway. True. Itachi agreed, this is one of the main roads to the capital, they're incredibly foolish and overconfident if they think they'll survive prowling in this area. Naruto shrugged, we can eliminate them if they choose to engage us, but not the other way around because we can't leave the caravan unprotected for too long. Shisui opened his mouth to say something but froze as he sensed three chakra signals closing into them. Naruto, Itachi, they're coming towards our direction. What? They exclaimed in disbelief. Shisui nodded, seriously. What are they thinking? He frowned, wait, now that they're closer. I can sense that they have decent chakra pools, around Haichin and Tolojanin level perhaps. Naruto scowled at that, damn it. He turned to the side, where he could see Sai and Shin already coming towards their direction. Sai. Shin. Tell the guard captain and Wakabadano to speed this caravan up. Activate the barrier I prepared and continue guarding Lord Wakaba and his envoys. We're going after the leaders, we will catch up with you guys later. He barked his orders as he and the Uchiha cousins leapt from their cart. Yes Naruto-sama. Sai saluted before he ran towards the seal's triggers Naruto placed in his cart while Shin went to another direction to inform Lord Wakaba of the current situation. It didn't take long as the two groups were running towards each other, in fact the Kanaha shinobi even waited for them in a rocky clearing as three men burst from the forest. They were indeed the leaders his clone saw, and they were followed by ten bandits dressed in tattered kimonos. The first was a dark-skinned man, a tall bald man with pupilless eyes and manic grin on his face, wearing some sort of white cloth tied around his wrists and a short cape to cover his upper body. Second was a young man with spiky white hair, wearing a black kimono and scythe-like sword strapped on his waist. 
The third man made Naruto pause, as he recalled a face he recognized. The last member was a tall teen with slit eyes and cheerful grin, he was wearing a red tiger strip bandana to cover his head, a white sleeveless kimono shirt and black pants. The dark-skinned man hollered, I didn't expect our prey to so willingly wait for us. Hello there. Tall Antine greeted them cheerfully. The white-haired one didn't say anything but eyed the Kanaha shinobi contemplatively. Shisui eyed the dark-skinned one in distaste, a typical overgrown bandit with too much confidence. Out of curiosity, why did you come to us, usually no bandit would be stupid enough to continue trying to rob caravan guarded by shinobi. He couldn't help but point it out. As expected the dark-skinned one answered, we are the Sans Hoku, three colored ones, and we fear nothing. Especially not three shinobi runts like you. I, Kuro Asasari will give you a painful death. Naruto, Itachi, and Shisui looked at each other and back to the three criminals. Let me guess. Naruto began, is the guy with white hair Shiroi something and the guy with bandana is perhaps Benny Tora, Red Tiger. The presumed Benny Tora looked at Naruto in awe, how do you know my name is Benny Tora? Are you a physic or something? He asked in shock then as if an afterthought he added, the guy on my left is Shiroi Karasu by the way so that also right on the dot. Man, you're good. You're the one who told us you're the Sans Hoku. Shisui reminded them. Oh, right. Benny Tora grinned. He is an idiot, they decided inwardly. At any rate, is this supposed to mean that you're not going back off if we ask? Naruto asked rhetorically for the heck of it. No. No. Brat. Kuro is pat. I suppose not. Naruto rolled his eyes and without a warning he unsheathed Hokuto Shishize and slashed it downward, creating a blade of wind cutting everything on its path. The so-called Sans Hoku quickly fled as the rock they were standing on was torn apart by the wind blade. Kuro Asasari snarled at Naruto. What the hell? How dare you attack us so cowardly? He and his companion once again had to dodge incoming attack, this time at a cyclone cloaked in flame as the two Uchiha combined their Gukakua with Naruto's Tatsumaki. Kuroa was about to holler a curse but he scrambled out of the lightning threads that almost trapped him in a cage-like barrier. We're Shinobi. Shisui pointed out as he drove Kuro away from the group. We never play fair, dumbass. He pointed out the obvious as the dark-skinned man scrambled to dodge his lightning. Shiroi Karasu shifted as he dodged the wind blade and in an instant Itachi closed in, swinging Tenro in a vertical slash. Karasu backed away to dodge but started when he felt the blade ruffle to the top of his hair and managed to move away again, barely missing from being torn in two. What a long sword. He couldn't help but comment. Isn't it too long for you, boy? Itachi didn't answer instead coating his sword in flames as a fire dragon with a gaping jaw jumped out from his sword towards the pale-skinned male. Inryuo, fire dragon, the white-haired then man dispersed into white petals before materializing again behind Itachi who narrowed his eyes. Genjutsu As the two Uchiha drove their opponents away deeper to the forest, Naruto was left alone with Benny Tora in the clearing. The spear wielder frowned when he saw Naruto sheathing his sword. Oi, kid, I get it you and your friends are strong but that's no reason to underestimate me. He looked to two separate directions his friends had gone to back and forth. You even went as far as to isolate us one by one, which doesn't really matter as much as we usually move on our own so it's not like being together can make us stronger by working together you know. Naruto narrowed his eyes as Benny Tora circled him like a hawk, his fast movements leaving after images which stopped moving while he continued to circle around until there were eight of them. Yo. One of them cheered. Benny Tora grinned, I am the Shadow Master. Hey. Hey. Even if you're a kid, you're a ninja so I won't hold back. Another said. Naruto just smiled at that, good choice. Quite true. So true. Very true. Benitara's shadows all turned around and saw copies of the shinobi holding kunai that was pointed at all of his copies. This is. Naruto snorted, a pretty neat technique you have there, a variation of our bushin no jutsu, one you created without hand seals, perhaps with the constant chakra emissions you were putting out when you were circling me around. That after image is not merely an after image but chakra that gradually takes shape to be your clone. A very simple trick but amazing nonetheless, especially. 
Benny Tora shrugged, all of his shadows disappeared in a blink of an eye. Well, as expected of a Kanaha shinobi, very observant. When he dismissed them, there wasn't even a puff of chakra. If not for the need to move speedily to create those shadows, this technique would be a better version of the Bushin no Jutsu. Thank you. Naruto muttered, then his eyes narrowed. As for your previous question of why we purposely separated you. Just from the way you interacted tells us that you are not really familiar with each other. Eh. You can tell? Seriously? Benny Tora exclaimed incredulously. Naruto shrugged, we're shinobi of Kanaha, teamwork is one of the core tenets of our strength. That's cool. He complimented with a wide grin. But why split us up then? You guys are better fighting in a team than individually like us. He couldn't help but ask curiously. Naruto glanced at Benny Tora, his blue eyes find nothing but genuine curiosity. We're about to, but looking at you changed our mind. He said as recalling the documents regarding the royal family that Hakurei showed him a day before their departure. I asked my teammates to drive your comrades away because I am curious of you. Benny Tora tensed and Naruto knew he had the man. Wah, what are you curious about? Ha ha ha. I am not exactly a popular guy ha ha ha. Naruto crossed his arms, his eyebrow scrunched at the laughing man. Pray tell me, what is the crown prince of Hinokuni like you doing here? Tokugawa hide Tadasama. Benny Tora froze and stammered, what are you talking about? I don't know this hide Tada guy. Even though I am as handsome as a prince I am just. Naruto cut him off, pardon me, but please polish your lying skills before you try to lie to a shinobi. Hide Tadasama. He pointed out. Your voice is shaking and you are averting your focus from me, you are a terrible liar. Benny Tora groaned before he sat down and sulked. Fine. You win. I am not aware we're having a competition. Naruto said in confused tone. Pardon me for being rude, but as a shinobi of Kanaha I have to be careful with my conduct in presence of a member of Hinokuni's royal family, thus it's a must for me to confirm your identity, rest assured that my teammate isolated both Shiroi Karasu and Kuro Asasari so this will not compromise your identity. Tokugawa Hide Tada straightened his back, and at once his laid-back look changed to one that befitting of a regal prince. Well, in Kanaha those who are of noble birth who probably knows how I look like dresses like any other shinobi so I can't tell. So, you're one of a noble shinobi clan. Naruto frowned at that, my name is Uzumaki Naruto, my clan is distantly related to the Senja but we're not considered a noble clan in Kanaha. Not officially at least. The prince blinked at that, hmm. Uzumaki, I've heard of your clan. Wasn't your clan the one who designed our security seals? It's really awesome, those seals are at least a hundred years old but are still functioning, then again, the Uzumaki have been said to be the best seal crafters in history. A surge of pride ran through his very blood, and he suppressed his urge to grin proudly at the young prince. We're flattered by your kind words. Hide to Dasama. He spoke in his clan's place, giving the prince a respectful bow. Benny Tora snorted, cut the formality, I don't want that when I am outside of the palace. He waved his hand dismissively. And since you caught me, I'm here for a covered mission from my father. He jerked his thumb to the direction in which Itachi and Shiroi went off. The Sans Hoku is working for a man suspected for plotting a coup against our country. I sneaked in when he man was looking to form an assassination group to work for him. Naruto flinched, my deepest apologies, we hope we have not compromised your cover. He waved his hand in negative, nah, all of our lackeys went to support Kuroi and Shiroi, and thanks to you separating us, my cover is still safe and frankly I didn't need it anymore. He laughed boisterously, and Naruto couldn't help but think Hyde Tada was not a type who cared about his princely image. They're here to intercept Wakaba of N.A. no Kuni in hopes of gaining some leverage against my father and uncle, or so the boss said. He shrugged. I am done collecting evidence against the suspects. I actually meant to leave them in few days, and if possible take those two out of the picture. Not one to waste an opportunity, Naruto placed his hand above his heart. If you don't mind, we will be honored to eliminate the enemies of Hinokuni in your stead. Hyde Tada laughed at that, I wonder how old you really are? You can't be older than ten, but you're very sly to try to gain my favor. 
but I really like you, a bit too respectful for my tastes but you didn't gloss over yourself to get in my good side. Naruto just smiled at that as he unsealed a flare launcher from his scroll and sent a red flare up to the sky. Well, to be honest, it's a very pleasant surprise to find you here Hide Tadasama. Well, sometimes luck was on his side, showing up in the most unexpected ways and he was not complaining about it. Perhaps he didn't have to ask for help from spies Hakurei planted in court after all and risk blowing their cover. He didn't even have to plan anything to draw attention to himself. The next day. I see. Hyde Tada said as they're on their last hour of their journey to capital. You're on a mission to escort Lord Wakaba to my uncle. Of course he would be crazy to reveal all of his plans to Hyde Tada when he just met the man, and he didn't have to do so either to get what he wanted. Yes. Hyde Tada suddenly closed in, his face was just inches from theirs. It almost took all of their willpower to not react on instinct and attack the prince who foolishly entered their personal space. Not a very wise thing to do in a shinobi's presence. His usually slit eyes opened, you're seriously taking that kind old man towards my uncle? There's a Danuki that will eat that man alive. Naruto sweat dropped, am I right to assume that you're talking about your father? Hide to Dasama. He nodded, yeah. I assume you know how my family works, and call me Tora, call me Hyde Tada after we step on that stuffy palace of ours. As one they wondered if having this easygoing guy as the crown prince of Hinokuni was a good or bad thing for their country. It's rare to have such a good old man in a position of power, and I would be damned if that Tanuki dad of mine exploits him. As one the three shinobi waved their hands in negative gesture. No, we don't think so. N.A. no Kuni is so small I don't think I.I. Asusama is going to bother to exploit them. Like hell he won't. Hide Tada, now dubbed as Tora exclaimed. That old man has grubby hands like you have never seen before. He is an old bastard who will use anything to get what he wants. Okay, it seemed that they're not so lucky after all if this how their prince voiced his opinion in regards to his father. In fact. Naruto rolled his eyes to the side it seems that things are getting even more complicated. He had to say he was almost worried that things were going too smoothly, it seemed his fears were unfounded since this mission would proceed the same as they usually do. A tangled mess of problems you couldn't see the end and beginning of, and strangely enough, he felt more comfortable in this familiar territory. You know, even I am starting to get worried with how your mind deals with trouble and how you get used to it. Karama voiced his long-standing concern. Oh really? Chapter 15, 15th Legacy The Hinokuni capital was the jewel of the nation as a product of its unique landscape and architecture. The civilians area was structured in the same manner as any other town, merely sprawling outwards further with three times the average population density, what made it unique was the presence of the royal palace and the surrounding area for the aristocrats. It was like a fortress with its mountainous landscape covered in rough terrain littered with stairs cut into the rock leading up to the doorways of exclusive residences perched, terrace style as the ground rose. The grounds were inundated by trees, sakura, and willow and peach, turning the landscape into a sea of pinks and yellows and greens, which left the air heavy with their sweet fragrance. Not that the nobles would eat the fruit he had learned from other nobles that they planted peach trees to ward off evil and for its scent and beauty throughout the year. As they approached, the sun was setting, bathing the world in purple and silver, the lines of lanterns failing to provide more than a soft, flickering light that only enhanced the surreal and eerie splendor that had been cultivated. If Naruto had just been a practical shinobi, he would scoff at the seemingly mystical area that had no practical function whatsoever. However, as an Uzumaki, he knew better, it was all part of a giant seal crafted by his ancestors that had secured the capital, leaving it standing strong and largely untouched by time after more than a century. This city, it was also a part of his clan's legacy. Ah, you're smiling, Shisui pointed out the quirk on his lips. You look very happy for some reason, Naruto. Naruto blinked oolishly, touching his lips and found his lips forming a smile. I am. It's beautiful, the scenery, Itachi reasoned, such a simple thing is enough to make people smile. Naruto laughed at the two Uchiha. They had the wagon all for themselves again after Hyde Tada decided to go ahead to inform his uncle and father of their arrival. It's partly that, he allowed, but looking at this view reminds me, even if we're now apart, my clan's legacy lives on, even in this city. 
He murmured softly, gazing at the view with longing in his eyes. Ah, he needed to get stronger as soon as possible such that he would be able to legally claim his seat as clan head and restart the effort to search for survivors of Yuzuzi Agakuru's fall. For his clan, his family. Then, suddenly, a flash of red appeared on the corner of his eyes, disappearing as quickly as it appeared behind the lush willow trees. Just now. Naruto. Itachi called him out. Shisui looked anxious, don't poke your head out so suddenly like that. You startled me. The Uzumaki looked like he had just seen a ghost, and it worried his teammates. Naruto? Did you see something that bothers you? Itachi guessed. The query snapped him out of his daze and Naruto quickly returned to his original position, a sheepish expression colored his face. Ah, no, I thought I saw something but I was probably just imagining it. It was already pretty dark outside and the red lantern dyed the scenery in red tint so. It couldn't be, right? How no Shiro? Naruto had, to be honest, expected some pomp and ceremony or something along the line of theatrics nobles tended towards. Tokugawa Iemitsu, however, certainly did not share that common taste for theatrics considering, the moment they stepped inside the palace, Wakabadano was escorted to see their official daimyo, while he and his team was halted by someone who looked disturbingly like a young Sandaima dressed as one of the twelve guardians. The younger lookalike didn't bother introducing himself and merely stated his task was to escort them to his lord. It's been a while, Asuma-san. Itachi greeted the Sarutobi. Inwardly, Naruto gave himself a mental slap for forgetting that the Sandaime had a son who was appointed as a guardian around two years ago. Hakure had mentioned Sarutobi Asuma in passing as Sandaime's wayward son, who went off to get a bounty on his head as part of misguided teenage rebellion. Asuma eyed Naruto skeptically, it's none of my business, he began slowly even though, guardian or not, Asuma obviously considered Naruto's presence a concern due to his status, but since when was Uzumaki given permission to wander this far from Kanaha? He wondered out loud. He had a carefree air to him even within the halls of his employment but Naruto could tell this man was dangerous. As a chunin of Kanaha and sole heir of Uzumaki clan, Naruto has right to travel as long as he follows the proper procedure, Itachi replied, professionally. His eyebrow shot up at that. Chunin? Already? He shook his head exasperatedly, Ma. What's with Hokage lately? Promoting kids so young, we're in peaceful period and yet. Itachi exhaled softly. We work hard to be worthy of our promotion, Asuma-san. Asuma waved his hand in placating gesture. I am sure you all do, but be kids when you have the chance we're not in war now. On the surface at least. Still, for Uzumaki to be escorted to the capital by the two famous prodigies of the Uchiha clan, no less. His eyes narrowed at them. Inwardly, Naruto hoped Sandaime's son was not suspecting Itachi and Shishui had kidnapped him. Naruto is our friend, Shisui answered, lightheartedly. Still, you guys are unusual combination for a team. Right, an Uzumaki slash Jinchuriki plus Uchiha. What are you guys are up to? From his tone, it was obvious that he had no expectation of being answered, instead, he was voicing his suspicion of them out loud. It was a warning. I doubt the Hokage allows this boy to wander as he please. This time Naruto didn't let Itachi to answer for him. When it is a product of clan business, not even Hokage-sama has authority over me so long as said business is not a threat to Kanaha. Asuma looked shocked, obviously not expecting such eloquent answer from Naruto. Who? This was not the adorable toddler he saw last time, playing around his father's office. And what clan business are we talking about here? Especially considering who you want to meet and who got you this appointment. Asuma-san, is this an inquiry out of curiosity or an interrogation? Shisui returned, eyes narrowing at the Sarutobi. Asuma didn't expect one of the Uchiha to feel offended on Naruto's behalf, let alone both of them. Yatter, Yatter, Tosan, how the heck have you gotten these two Uchiha elites to be our Jinchuriki's protective teammates? They didn't even belong to the same generation. Shisui, the youngest shinobi in the group called out, it's fine. For a moment, his eyes flashed red but quickly darkened back to their normal, ebony orbs. HN. So the one who calls the shots in this team is the squirt. Asuma thought in bewilderment. 
My business is with Tokugawa-sama, should he allow you to remain, I'm sure you'll know all about it. In short, quit asking, if your lord thinks you're allowed to know, you will. How old was this brat was again? Around, eight or nine, and he already had silver tongue. Asuma swore, back at the academy, even Kakashi was not like this brat, mature? Yes, but this brat was like a de-aged adult. Naruto looked around, eyes flickering but his head was held still. Once upon a time, his grandfather, Muramasa, was walking through this majestic corridor with massive red pillars on both sides, shoji doors covered in a red and gold painting of immortal bird, and lanterns of various sizes hung on the center of corridor ceiling, illuminating the path and painting the scenery in warm tint of orange. Then, by the end of the corridor, he saw it, a row of massive and elaborate shoji doors guarded by two soldiers dressed in black and red armor. And behind this door, Naruto swallowed, suddenly nervous. Asuma stepped forward, Tokugawa-sama is expecting them, the escort team of Wakabadano from N.A. no Kuni. The guards nodded before bowing in unison as they pulled the doors open for them. Asuma was about to lead the way in but the guards crossed their spears, blocking his path. I I Asusama ordered you to go back to Tekaki Yosama. Your service is not needed for tonight. Asuma gritted his teeth around his cigarette, so who is by I I Asusama's side now? Mahiro Dano and Tatara Dano. A guard answered curtly. The wind user glanced at the team. I see. Mahiru and Tatara were shinobi that were solely loyal to the royal family i.e. Yasu himself to be specific and they had no previous affiliation to Kanaha or any other shinobi group as Asuma did. He had heard rumors from back home regarding suspicions of the Uchiha's involvement with Kyubia's attack, and if that was true, not to mention they had brought Naruto with them. If they wanted to inflict harm to i.e. Yasu, Mahiru and Tatara were not going to survive the ordeal. As if they could hear his line of thought. A young voice assured him from behind. We're here for diplomatic business. I think you should know that at least. Followed by a grown Asuma deducted as belonging to Uchiha Shisui and a signature Uchiha grunt from Uchiha Itachi. Then, as if their business with Asuma was over with, the Uzumaki Uchiha team walked past him without a single glance and disappeared behind the massive shoji doors. Looking at the barrier between them, Asuma could only hope he had not just done a great wrong to his home village. Tokijikuin, i.e. Yasu's personal quarter. Tokugawa i.e. Yasu had an intimidating presence not in the way the Sandai met or Hakure had with wisdom and aged strength coiled within an old body or any other shinobi variety kind of intimidating he was a man in his fifties with long ebony hair that reached his shoulders, with white streaks around his ears. He had sharp eyes that were focused like a hunting eagle's, a high nose and a defined chin. Unlike most nobles that wore brightly colored clothes showing off their status, he wore a plain outfit of dark red kimono, black haori and dull brown hakama. Naruto only got a brief glance at his face before he and his team were kneeling, face tilted downwards however he did manage to get a good look at Ie Yasu's hands, as, he was sure, Itachi and Shisui had also. Ie Yasu had calloused hands, and his skin complexion was far from pale. Definitely not your everyday noble that spend their days reading poetries and whatever else nobles did in their spare time. Thank you for this opportunity to meet you, Ii Asusama. It is an honor, Naruto began in even voice. I am Uzumaki Naruto from Kanahagakur. Ii Yasu's voice sounded amused. And the two Uchiha over there. My name is Uchiha Itachi, he answered, of Kanahagakur, also the heir of Uchiha clan. I am Uchiha Shisui of Kanahagakur. Ii Yasu's eyebrow shot up at their name, who heir of Uchiha clan and Uchiha Kagamai's son. What a line we have here. He glanced at Naruto. You, however, I have never seen an Uzumaki with that hair color. Though I do recall an old acquaintance of mine with that kind of hair. He was not going to entertain anything less than blunt regarding Naruto's not-so-secret pedigree, it seemed. I am indeed my grandfather's grandson. He answered vaguely. So, Uzumaki. Yes. Ie Yasu crossed his arms with a cocked brow. His strong hands disappear beneath his wide sleeves. What are your intentions in revealing yourself here, Uzumaki Naruto? Calling for an old debt of mine to a family whose name you don't even bear. Naruto swallowed heavily, that was a sore topic even for him. No. I am not here to call out an old favor, I don't deserve it. 
So what is it you want from me, boy? His grandson or not, I don't have all day for a shinobi with no interest in serving me. Then I shall be direct, I I Asudano, Naruto steeled his resolve. What I want is political backing from royal family of Hai no Kuni. A heavy silence fell before it was broken by a low growl from the Kunoichi who was standing guard on Ieyasu's left. The shinobi on his right looked amused, while Ieyasu himself merely seemed thoughtful. Ieyasu narrowed his eyes. But what can you offer me and my family in return, boy? Everything I can offer as future head of Uzumaki clan, Naruto answered firmly, keeping the possibility wide open. Not the wisest thing to promise to a man like Tokugawa Ieyasu, but Naruto was desperate. Within reason, of course, Naruto added as an afterthought, his inexperience showing. He snorted. Future head of Uzumaki clan, huh? Officially, Naruto elaborated. But in practice, I already hold the authority as the clan head, within the boundaries of the Tower of Sealing. He exhaled softly before adding. It shouldn't be long before I inherit full authority, officially. He could, even now, because, as he had told Asuma himself, Hokage-sama had no power over clan business as long as it didn't harm Kanaha. The only thing stopping him from doing so was simply because it was more trouble than it was worth at the present time due to his position. However, as long as he had strong backing from an outsider who still had affiliation with Kanaha namely Ieyasu their path would be smoother. My, why is a young shinobi like you playing the game of politics already? For the first time, the shinobi who was standing in the background spoke out and, much to Naruto's surprise, Ieyasu didn't reprimand him for speaking out of turn. Sensing Naruto's curious look on him he added, I am Tatsuka Tatara. Nice to meet you, Naruto-kun. He was a slim young man with short, neatly combed, light brown hair and brown eyes. He was wearing a simple brown kimono top that was slightly open, exposing the black inner shirt and elaborate flame tattoo. A more elaborate looking umbu tattoo with more tongues of flame. Humra. Ieyasu's very own personal guardians. The Shadow Twelve Guardians of Hai no Kuni. I am the weakest among my team, though. It was very clear one thought crossed their mind, who was going to buy that? Even though Tatsuka Tatara, with his gentle smile, handsome face, and lithe build, fit the description of weak looking to AT. It's true, Ieyasu confirmed with amused look on his face. Though I believe I don't keep useless people around me. I am flattered, my lord, Tatsuka Tatara chimmered in before turning his attention back to Naruto or, to be precise, the Uchiha cousins who were kneeling few steps behind him. I suppose it has something to do with your Uchiha friends. Their clan has not been in a favorable position for the last few years, after all. Naruto forced back his bodily reactions to not give away his shock. He should have expected that Ieyasu was not ignorant of Kanaha's politics. Itachi and Shisui were in the same condition, and shame crept up in their hearts. So, it's for your friend. Tatsuka asked gently, like asking a young child what those cookies they stole from the jar for. No wonder Ieyasu kept this man around, with just few well-placed words he was making a fool out of them. Naruto looked up, for the first time really looking at Tatsuka Tatara. And there were no negative emotions from this man at all. He could tell that much from Kurama's side effect. Unlike the other biju, Kurama didn't grant him some unique elemental power, instead providing something subtler. It was the ability to sense ill intent and it was very useful once he let go of his rose-tinted worldview. Although, back then, it was probably a good thing Naruto was oblivious, he would have been driven insane had he noticed all of the rotten thoughts from the villagers who hated him. This person however. Naruto looked up at Tatara, his eyes narrowed. This man was really treating Naruto and his teammates as children with no ill intention whatsoever. Shinobi were used to deceit and lies, so sincerity and open honesty more often than not threw them off of their tune. Naruto knew this very well, after all he was usually the one on the giving end, not receiving. It's for Kanaha. He answered firmly, and his friends were part of Kanaha so it was not just about a small part of his beloved village. Even if the large part of its populace were oblivious and ungrateful fools. An idealist, hmm. <laughs> Ieyasu smirked. To protect your village in the name of your will of fire. Naruto stilled, holding his tongue from denying that remark recklessly. 
He inhaled deeply and said, I don't see myself as such, as a shinobi of Kanaha, I do believe in the will of fire, however. His voice hardened, losing all trace of his childish traits. I am not so foolish as to think of my village as they might be depicted in the will of fire. I am not so blind as to not see how they are rather than how they choose to present themselves. Ieyasu uncrossed his arms, his pose relaxed. So? What is Kanaha? A shinobi village. Naruto answered in a matter-of-fact tone. Kanaha was born of Senju Hashirama's and Uchiha Madara's dream, their ideology. But a child never grows to be the perfect image their parents idealized, and neither did Kanaha. So, unlike most of your fellow Kanaha shinobi, you don't place your village on a higher pedestal than other villages. He sounded amused. Not even in morality. Naruto shook his head, it's a matter of perspective, perhaps we're just better at hiding our skeletons. Regardless of what kind of image we sell to our clients, we still took part in three great wars and we kill our enemies as much if not more so than other village. In the end, we are shinobi. You speak as if you have seen war, Ieyasu pointed out in skeptical tone. He had seen it, through the eyes of his parents at least. I believe you are aware of what I am, Ieyasu Dano. The Lord narrowed his eyes at that statement. We exist as deterrent of war but at the same time, we're also the greatest weapons available. I have been in this position since I was born. Do I have to see war to fear and hate it? So you will refuse to aim your power to Kanaha's foe. I am a shinobi of Kanaha, Naruto stated with conviction. I would do what I believe is the best for my village. Ieyasu let out a booming laugh and respond, surprising them as the sounds escaped the notorious lord's lips, uncensored. Ha 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 ha. As expected of Miramis's grandson. You haven't even ever met him and yet. You have the same resolve as a shinobi. In Ieyasu's mind, Muramasa was always, a man with gentle soul, and yet his hands were ever forging steel to protect his country. Once, in his youth, Ieyasu had asked Muramasa why the man became a shinobi and stayed loyal to Hai no Kuni and Kanaha even though he had seen the dark side of his homeland. Instead of some complex justification, he had simply replied that it was because Kanaha and Hai no Kuni, they were his home. And he loved his home so he would do the best he could do. For them. No convoluted words, no complicated motives. Muramasa was a simple man. However, at the same time, I don't think you're him. You are not the same as Muramasa, Ieyasu drawled after he regained his composure. So I wonder. What it is that makes you different. I have met your father, too, and I have to say, you are not him either. His eyes narrowed. If I have to compare Muramasa and Minato, it becomes obvious that they both had a gentle soul as a person while simultaneously possessing the heart of steel as a shinobi. And the father and son certainly weren't identical in personality, but, at their core, they were the same. Uzumaki Naruto however was not cut from the same fabric as his father and grandfather. So show me, Ieyasu ordered in an authoritative tone that left no room for refusal. Show me who you are. Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto looked up and, for the first time since he met Ieyasu, the shinobi met Ieyasu's eyes with a firm gaze. How would you like me to show you? He asked in an even tone. In answer, Ieyasu ordered Tatsuka to bring an object forward and Naruto cursed inwardly. Ten minutes later. He sorely regretted leaving the choice to Ieyasu, he expected something along the lines of a mission or a riddle. Board games were, a traditional method for nobles to measure someone's skill, and even their personality, so it didn't surprise Naruto that Ieyasu pulled out an elaborate looking shogi board and asked for a game. Expecting it or not, however, Naruto didn't like playing strategy games like shogi. While he played shogi, go, reiki and other games just fine, he was not a master for all that he was a good enough player. It was part of his education as heir of Uzumaki clan, after all. Nevertheless, Naruto disliked exercising strategy in the confines of a board, real life battle didn't work like a game. He didn't feel like he could show Ieyasu who is he through a board game. Clack. As of now they were about even, but Naruto had no delusions that it was because he had sufficiently held his own against Ieyasu. The ebony-haired lord was taking this slow, probing his defenses, and waiting for Naruto's respond to his attack. Regardless, 
Naruto would like to believe he was playing reasonably well for someone with less than one year experience under his belt. Clack. That move just now was the equivalent of chopping off one of his limbs in battle by kicking his Kama off the board and preventing his gold general from escaping. Naruto fought his hardest against the following onslaught, but in the end, he was just stalling the game to go on as long as possible while looking for a chance for counter-attack. So far, he saw none. Ieyasu definitely didn't care about playing it easy against someone with lesser experience. He didn't hold back at all. At this rate, all Ieyasu could see was what kind of player and how much experience he had. How informative was that? Some illogical part of him just wanted to win the game just to prove Ieyasu wrong that he could get an easy win from Naruto, while the logical part reminded him that he was not playing to win, he was here to get acknowledgement from this man. However, when he saw a chance to counter-attack, a way to win the game, Naruto's hand moved his piece with resounding clack against the board. He sweated heavily as he read the board, ascertaining for himself that the opening was not a trap. It wasn't. Then Naruto realized it was only an opening simply because no one but he would be crazy enough to do this kind of maneuver just to get an even ground at the risk of his king piece. He had just sent a message to Ieyasu that he was a risk taker who jumped at the smallest opening even at the cost of the game. Definitely not what he wanted Ieyasu to think of him. It was not. We're even now. Ieyasu stated the matter of factually. Huh. He didn't even notice they were on stalemate now. A small part of him was delighted with the situation, even though this draw was hardly skill. Instead, it was partially luck, partially the unpredictability of suicidal maneuvers, and stubbornness. But now what I wonder? Ieyasu said and for the first time he sounded unsure to Naruto's ears. You're not the kind of person who can reflect yourself fully on the board. Apparently, this game is not enough to know you as much as I like. His heart began to pound partially relieved that Ieyasu was aware of this and partially dreading what the Lord was going to throw him next. Well then, let's cut the chase, shall we? Instead of some complicated game of wits and skill, why don't you just tell me, Uzumaki-kun? Tell you what? He wanted to say, but he stayed still and waited for Ieyasu to finish. The ebony-haired man smirked at him and Naruto realized, whatever Ieyasu was going to say next, Hide to his father was definitely playing another mind game his son hated so much. His hand swept over the unfinished game and he continued. Which side are you on upon this board? What are you representing, in this world, Uzumaki-kun? You must be fucking kidding me. Naruto cried mentally in shock. That was too vague. It's a simple question, Ieyasu stated smugly. Don't you think so? The sarcasm was so thick and a small part of him was vengeful enough to wish for Ieyasu to choke on it. He looked at the shogi pieces and the board laid before him and then to the face of true ruler of Hai no Kuni. He could feel those dark eyes staring into the depth of his soul, daring him to make his move. A move that would decide their future and, if he made a wrong decision, everything he had worked so hard for would crumble beneath his very hand. Inaruto stammered. Now, boy. Choose the piece that represents your standing on this board. Tell me who you are. Are you a Kama, Knight, or perhaps a mere pawn? Naruto didn't answer but he knew he was neither. Or perhaps. The dark-eyed ruler flipped the Hisha, Rook, piece. You are a daring piece, a sleeping dragon waiting for his chance to ascend to be the Ryuo, Dragon King. Shisui and Itachi felt a fear unlike any other they'd experienced before as they knelt behind Naruto who was still contemplating his choice. They didn't know if there was any way out of this as their trained minds told them that the Daimyo's question was one of those trick questions with no correct answer. If Naruto lowered himself, that meant his worth was not enough for Tokugawa Ieyasu to pay any attention to him, but if he dared to choose ambitiously, he would be seen as a would-be usurper, a dangerous piece. There was no correct answer within the board, and Naruto, too, knew that. So he chose to do the craziest and unthinkable thing ever recorded done in the history of Hai no Kuni before the mighty ruler. He flipped the board down and sent all the pieces clattering onto the tatami floor. Ieyasu smirked. So that's your choice. Uzumaki Naruto. Yes. Naruto barely acknowledged the sound of restless shifting behind him. No doubt both Itachi and Shisui were doing their best to not jump between him and Ieyasu. 
All Uchiha had ironclad control of themselves, and that impressive control was on the verge of breaking in fear of his recklessness. He wanted to assure his friends that he knew what he was doing but that would be a lie because Naruto was operating on what felt right, not what he knew was right, now. I am, Uzumaki Naruto, and I am not a piece in game of life. And in the first place, the world we live in can't be represented within a 9x9 board. I don't move only in specified lines like a piece and as a shinobi, more often than not, I don't play by the rules. He stated, a matter of factually. I.e. Yasuo's eyes narrowed, piercing his own. You are a child, and yet you're saying you're a player, not a piece. Naruto inhaled deeply and continued. If I am a player, I should abide by the rules. I am not. I will not. And you should know that you have never talked to a child, but to a shinobi by the name Uzumaki Naruto. His eyes shifted briefly to the side before it gazed back evenly at I.E. Yasuo. At least in mind, I have long since ceased to be a child. He didn't even know when he had stopped being a child. One day, he woke up and he saw children in the tower as children. And he was not one of them. So you claim to be a mature adult. He sounded even more amused now. Claiming maturity is self-defeating, I would say. Naruto cocked his head to the side. I.E. Yasuo smirked. You're an interesting person. Naruto could. It didn't escape Naruto that I.E. Yasuo called him by his given name now and not by his surname. I aim to please, he quipped. I.E. Yasuo cleared his throat. So about your proposal? He trailed off, rubbing his chin. I approve of you as a person in a shinobi, and an alliance with the head of Uzumaki clan is rewarding, regardless of your position. However. Naruto wondered when the but would stop. However. What do you want to do with political backing from my family? I.E. Yasu asked him bluntly. Proving your worth as the heir of Uzumaki clan. Revenge against the villagers who wronged you and your friends. Or perhaps you want to conquer Kanaha yourself. The first was still a reasonable guess but the latter's were outrageous. For the first, it is none of Kanaha's business considering I only have to prove my worth to my clan members and our vassal families. Revenge would get me nowhere and go against everything I live for, and I have no interest to rule Kanaha. So you have no dream to be the Hokage. Once, he had such a childish wish, thinking that if he became the Hokage, the villagers would acknowledge him. He knew better now, it was the reverse. Someone became the Hokage after the acknowledgement. Kanaha, Ceiling Division Tower. An apprentice. Yuzuruha mouthed out. Me. Hakure nodded. You're already sixth Dan by rights, you should have started thinking about taking a disciple when you get your fifth. He cocked his head to the side. Come to think of it, it's just about time for Naruto-sama, too. He was already the fifth Dan now, and at the rate he was going, he would take qualification exam for sixth Dan, soon. It was almost scary how fast he was storming through their ranks, even for an Uzumaki. Then again, their master abused Kage Bunshin like it was going out of Fashian on a daily basis. Yuzuruha scoffed, I will take it slow, Shishao. There is no rule saying we have to take a disciple. Actually, in Naruto Sama's case, it becomes a must if we want to stop this charade. Namely, Hakure posing as the one in charge of the tower while, in reality, it was Naruto Sama. I believe Naruto Sama is more than capable of gaining Ie Yasuo's trust. His soft spot for Muramasa aside, Naruto Sama has a knack in getting people to side with him. An amazing charisma I have never seen since Mito Sama. Yuzuruha was sure that if Naruto Sama was here, he would yell at Hakure for throwing around compliments he didn't deserve or so their master thought but everyone knew otherwise. Well, taking a disciple would be another boost to Naruto Sama's credentials. And as leader of Sealing Tower, it was part of his duty to tutor the next generation. Takuza, who was sitting beside Hakure as filing his paperwork chimmered in, does Naruto-sama even his time to tutor someone? Then he added, and who? Who? Yuzuruha hummed, searching for candidates on his mind. Mukun, perhaps. Mu, or Murasaki, was the youngest Shiamitsu child, and Shian's son. Takuza waved his hand in negative. Mukun is three years old even if he starts early, Shian as his father, 
should be the one who handles the foundation stage of his education. Atla is a better choice. Another cousin of theirs, who was two years younger than their master. Hakure shook his head. She and just submitted paperwork to take Atla as his disciple yesterday. He sighed, besides, do you think Naruto-sama is the type who would take a disciple for formality's sake? J.A.A. then we can take an outsider, then. Naruto-sama would love to promote our openness to Kanaha with taking disciple from outside. Yuzuruha exclaimed. Shion, the eldest disciple of Hakure came in just in time to hear what Yuzuruha said. And that would be another political nightmare, don't you think? Eh? It's not like our ceiling arts gets famous overnight. Requests for tutoring might be trickling in but we're not the most fashionable art after the main Nintaijen, Yuzuruha pointed out to her cousin. She inside at that. No, we don't get famous overnight but, due to the recent overhaul of all security seal systems in prominent clans of Kanaha, because of Aizen's betrayal, no one wanted to use seal designed under leadership of a traitor, they seem to finally realize that our seals run almost everything that was automatic. There was a good reason why Hashirama married Izumaki Mito, their eternal alliance aside. A village couldn't work without a working system and, in its baby state, Kanaha had to establish a running security, information, communication, and whatever else, using seals. Sure, it ceased to be all seal use as Kanaha's manpower increased, but Kanaha was still built with few injutsu as its foundation. So say, if all active shinobi were sent out on missions, all few injutsu-based systems would still be running and Kanaha would be relatively safe from invasion. Relative was the keyword but still. As I am the one in charge of new applicants, it had surprised me to find that most of them are from prominent clans, Shian added with a sigh. I mean, how moronic would it be if they just realized how vital our art in this village now, right? Back to Hawa Palace. I plead you to not take this child under your wing, Iyasusama. The Kunoichi, who went by the name Mahiro, said while glaring at Naruto. She was fairly tall for a woman, with a curvaceous body that was wrapped in a short, sleeveless, black kimono with a red obi. Her tattoo of Humra was shown proudly on her left breast. Naruto was very tempted to roll his eyes at Shisui who was trying his best to not look so obvious while ogling the buxom Kunoichi. Ieyasu just raised an eyebrow at his Kunoichi, while Tatsuka chided Mahiro. Why not? Naruto-kun is a wonderful shinobi. Our master has just taken a liking of him and you know our master doesn't like just anyone. He has nothing to give in return. She pointed at Naruto with gloved finger. And you know that getting in Uzumaki Senju Uchiha affairs never ends well for anyone. Naruto, Itachi, and Shisui inwardly winced in unison at the last remark. They couldn't blame her for thinking that getting involved with them was a bad idea. Which is why there is the concept of, investing, Mahiro-chan and as for their family history, I believe, in the end, it's their business not ours, Tatsuka assured her. Besides, our country and kingdom are still standing today even though, we got a new valley. There is a good reason why none from the Senju and Uchiha clans managed to attain guardian rank. Mahiro pointed out with a hiss. I don't even want to know the next new landmark the so-called Rakuto Senin's descendants are going to carve upon our nation. Apparently only Kanaha Shinobi saw Valley of the End as a mark of history, everyone else thought it was the result of a family feud gone wrong. Tatsuka, Mahiro. The two Shinobi stilled an instant. Be quiet. And just like that, the two arguing Shinobi quieted down, becoming very still on their seats to the point Naruto was concerned whether they were breathing or not. Ieyasu seemed to tolerate his shinobi's antics to a degree, but he still had ironclad control over them. The following silence was almost deafening, but Ieyasu looked to be deep in thought and Naruto didn't dare to interrupt. The silence was blessedly broken five minutes later with a bang, and all heads whipped towards the shoji door that had already been thrown off of its frame. Itachi and Shisui, who had opportunity to meet a certain youthful jonin, wondered if Tokugawa Hidetada was somehow related to him. That was one loud dynamic entry. Don't you dare to corrupt Naruto-kun, Yudanuki Yara. Huh. The following chaos made Naruto regret hoping for the silence to end. It took 15 minutes in a chakra chain to get Hidetada to calm down. It didn't escape anyone's notice that Hidetada was drunk. Apparently Ieyasu was winning the award for the worst father of the year, 
and Hyde Tada had an interesting childhood with a father like his. In short, his paranoia and disdain towards his father was all legit and, all things considered, it was a miracle Hyde Tada had not plotted an assassination instead of running away from home. Naruto was sure everyone in the room agreed that their prince shouldn't touch alcohol at all if he ended up spilling the entire story of his life just from a few sips. Then I found out that I am half Uzumaki and Okasama is not my Kachan. He babbled on from his chained state. Naruto's eyes went wide at that as his eyes went to Benitara's shaven head and spotted the signature red hair of the Uzumaki. What? I am so glad to see you, little cousin. But you just have to make me to bring you to my Tanuki Oyoji. He cried somberly. Naruto's brain tried to process the fact that, not only was Benitora distantly related to him, but that Ieyasu had taken an Uzumaki as his consort. There must be some sort of convoluted backstory here and, judging from Ieyasu's bored face, the Lord expected this to happen and was not bothered Naruto the head of Uzumaki clan knew about this. So, cousin, let's leave this stuffy palace, and bring our clansmen together. We will live happily ever after as one big family. Away from the Tanuki bastard. Hide Tada babbled on. Naruto promptly grabbed Hide Tada's forehead and said, Okay, that's enough. Benny Tora yelped. Hot. Gyaaya. Channeling Uzumaki Chakra mixed with a small dose of Karama's potent Yuki, he detoxed Benitara's body from alcohol. It was a nifty trick he had learned when, out of curiosity, he had asked Karama whether or not it was possible to use a Bijuu's chakra to detox toxins and the likes from non ki bodies. According to Karama, in theory, it was possible but only for humans descended directly from Rakuto Senin or naturally in possession of a sturdy body that could withstand a Bijuu's chakra. Like Kinkaku and Ginkaku. Shisui and Itachi had volunteered as test subjects before and it had worked but it was definitely not the most pleasant experience for them. The good news there was that no damage to their body occurred as long as Naruto mixed the chakra with some of his to neutralize the corrosive nature. Gah! What the? Have you come to your senses? Naruto asked. You know. Hide to Aji, if you want to take part in this discussion, you have to be at least sober. Benny Tora blinked. Call me Tora, and I didn't mean to get wasted this badly but... He glanced at his father with eyes narrowed and clouded with anger. Naruto didn't need to know personally know either father son to guess, they got into an argument and Benny Tora got himself wasted, only to crash the meeting just to spit on Ieyasu. Shisui and Itachi, who had been too quiet even for Naruto's taste, tapped his shoulder. Oi, Naruto. I think we've stumbled upon something we shouldn't have. Are we in trouble? Itachi wondered from his other side and, for once, Itachi sounded hesitant. Political support was one thing, getting involved in their internal affairs was an entirely different kin of worms. To be honest, Naruto wasn't sure himself. E, to be honest, things getting complicated now should fit our track record. I'm sure we can get everything to work out, somehow. Naruto. I am telling you. There must be something wrong to be relieved in this kind of situation. Karama cried from the depths of his mind. Naruto rolled his eyes mentally, oh you. Karama, you worry wart. He cut the connection when Karama started to rant again. So, I I asu sama, about our business. Hide to the sama. Mahiro began to protest. Even though this boy is related to you, he. You do realize if your prince is related to Naruto, it means that he is also like us. A descendant of Rakuto Senin. Shisui pointed out. Mahiro growled at him and, for one stupid moment, Shisui thought her growl was hot. He kept his opinions to himself though. And you know. I don't know how the court shinobi system works but, as far as I know, shinobi shouldn't question orders from their superiors, especially when said superior had already gone through a lot of trouble to decide upon it. Tatsuka smiled at Shisui who beamed back at him. He is right, you know. Mahiro snarled. Unless, you can raise a valid concern regarding this alliance. Besides, we have not heard how this would go yet. Iyasusama has not said anything about the details. To disagree with our lord is simply. Iyasu scoffed. I am up to giving all the political support Naruto-kun needs including educating him in politics, philosophy, and law. 
Naruto narrowed his eyes at that. That was too extensive for a simple alliance. You're going to make me your ward? But that means me losing my rights as an adult in Kanaha law. Something that official is beneficial in the long run, but I imagine your council will put up a fight considering your pedigree and status. Naruto sighed in relief. However, in the end, I have to justify my backing on you if I want to go that far so I will just have you engaged to my daughter. Silence. Once again, eerie silence fell over the room as all the occupants, except Ieyasu were shocked out of their wits. Tatsuka recovered first, commenting on how a political marriage could work and how this was getting even more interesting. Mahiro and Benitora were next, with one pleading her master to reconsider while Benitora started screaming at his father. Milord, this is already too much. Just because he is Miramasasama's grandson, it doesn't mean he deserves to be a part of your family. Ieyasu rolled his eyes. I am not looking at second coming of Muramasa, and surely I know better on who deserves that right. Mahiro shrunk in shame at the reprimand. He is nine, you sick Tanuki. My sister is thirteen. There is no age limit for engagements, my wayward son, and no one said I was marrying them now. As for the age difference, do you have something to say to Lady Go who is eight years older than you? Hide Tada flushed red for, while they were engaged for political purposes, he liked his fiancé a lot even though they were eight years apart. He was so not going to bring up the topic, unless he wanted to get kicked six ways to Sunday by his fiancé. Political marriage, was not a foreign concept to Naruto, but his vassals didn't teach him this. They were afraid that mentioning the unpleasant part of his duty as the clan heir would upset him. It was something he expected to be part of, being the heir of a prominent clan. While his parents married for love, it didn't escape Naruto's notice that his father married his mother after he had gained both his reputation and title. It was not much a stretch of imagination that Hakure and Songetsu had set a condition for their marriage. Heirs of prominent clans couldn't marry as they pleased without the good of the family being involved, simply because their marriage was not just between two persons, but also involving the whole clan. He sighed. That makes sense. Benitora suddenly was already in front of him and Naruto absent-mindedly noted he is fast and rolled his eyes at him, are you crazy, look he got. My father just told you to get engaged with my little sister as payback for the political backing he promised to you, he said pointedly. He is putting a leash on you that ties you to our family and your response to that is, that makes sense. Are you for real? Naruto shrugged. It's some sort of insurance, he replied, equally pointed, this is politics. And it can't be as simple as I scratch your back and you scratch mine. With no guarantees that no backstabbing will occur when one's back was turned. You're fine with marrying my sister. We're related, yeah no. Naruto rolled his eyes. All right, so, is your mother's name Uzumaki Fuzu? Benitora blinked. Er, no. Then Naruto began to list ten more names and Benitora answered negative to all of them. In that case, your mother is most likely very distantly related to me, and we're past second to third cousin for sure. Her name is Tsubone, i.e. Yasu supplied helpfully. Her family name is Miyanaga though. Typically, a lot of Uzumaki hid their surnames by either not using one at all or using fake one. Tsubone. Naruto echoed, recalling list of name from family records. I am not sure her name is on the list, that's not her real name either, any. Hide to his eyes widened, it's a custom that, when someone becomes a Tokugawa, they receive new name her birth name is Masako. That was one name Naruto had mentioned. Oh, then she is my mother's third cousin, once removed. She was still very distantly related to him. Shisui hissed. Oi, Naruto, are you seriously okay getting engaged to a girl you don't even know? He whispered to him. I mean, what if she has buck teeth or thick lips? Considering Uzumaki features in general plus Itokugawa's, Naruto was sure that was very unlikely. This is a political marriage. Looks didn't matter that much. Hide Tada opened his mouth to protest again but Tatsuka beat him to it. Then, should we solve this shinobi style? He suggested with a disarming smile that didn't match his tone. Ieyasu smirked. Oh? I thought you weren't against this arrangement, Tatara. Tatsuka beamed. 
I'm not while it makes sense to tie the knot with the Uzumaki clan, we have to take it to consideration that if we go this deep, he gestured towards Benny Tora, your heir, Hide to Dasama, has to agree. Naruto narrowed his eyes, digesting the implication. This alliance would be a long-standing one and Ieyasu was not getting younger. Considering his position, it was not much a stretch to think he could drop dead without warning and leaving Hyde Tada to rise into power. There was no point in getting the alliance now if Hyde Tada would dissolve it in later years. You mean Shinobi Way is in? Naruto trailed off. A team battle, Tatsuka finished. You and your team versus Hyde to Dasama, me and Mahiro. Three on three. He beamed. Naruto frowned. Why a team battle? This alliance dash. Your clan is affiliated closely with the Uchiha, any. Tatsuka continued. Not officially, at least, but still. That was not a wild guess. Naruto had never felt this naked in front of strangers who had only known him for less than a few hours. Yes, but. Then it involves them, too. Considering your ancestry, they're not really. Itachi interrupted. We only share Rakuto Senin as our ancestor. Tatsuka blinked and shared a look with his master. Ho, oh, please don't tell me you have no idea who Muramasa was married to. Mayumi Basama I do know my grandmother's name. Naruto couldn't help but felt offended of the accusation. Tatsuka shared another look with his master, who looked amused by the whole ordeal. All right. That aside, Iyasu-sama, do you agree with this? Iyasu smirked. Well, why not? Mahiro, hide Tada, if you disagree with my decision, you better win. He said in saccharine tone. If you lose this match, I will not hear any objection from you. And, hide Tada, if by some chance I croak, as you put it, this agreement is permanent and set. Hide Tada gritted his teeth and turned towards Naruto. You know, Naruto, you're a good kid. No, you're a good guy, he corrected. There must be some other way for you to achieve your wish without getting involved with my father. That's why. I will defeat you and your team. Naruto inhaled softly. In the end, that shogi match only served for Ieyasu to judge his character and nothing more. He glanced at Tatsuka who was smiling innocently, Ieyasu had plotted for this to occur from the beginning. Shogi could only show a small part of his character and what wits he possessed, it didn't show him power. This was how this world works, without power, you couldn't change anything. Underground training room. This must be where the shinobi in service for royal family trained. The room, though large, was void of decoration and appeared to be built entirely from concrete. Naruto noted some part of the room had the ceiling height built around the same as other room he saw in the palace, most likely this place was designed with simulating battle inside the palace in mind. Hmm. <laughs> Benny Tora stretched his legs then craned his neck. Yosh. He was very confident, Naruto noted. It didn't seem he was unfamiliar with his father's bodyguards so they must have been working together before if he had faith in their teamwork. This won't be easy for sure. Not to mention. Naruto glanced at the sword on his waist. It was shuddering, clacking against its sheath. Hokuto Shishize, it's whining. He turned towards the Uchiha cousins, finding both of them eyeing their respective sword with unease. Shivien and Tenro, too. It was no wonder, though. Shizaiden were initially forged to protect Hai no Kuni and the royal family. With Benny Tora as one of their opponents, the Shizaiden were rejecting taking any part in this fight. Naruto heaved a sigh before he untied Hokuto from his waist. There was no point keeping Hokuto with him if he ended up drawing the sword reflexively and Hokuto turned on him. Maybe Hokuto wouldn't, considering he was Miramis's grandson, but it was better to be careful than sorry later. Who? I am surprised to see the three Shizaiden back. Ieyasu's voice boomed through the room, and Naruto glanced at the viewing booth on their left that was covered with seal-reinforced glass. There must be a transmitter seal somewhere in this room, Naruto guessed. Though it seems they're not cooperative due to my son's presence. Naruto glanced at his teammates, seeing that they had also taken the Shizaiden off of their backs. They had coming to the same conclusion as him. I am glad, he couldn't help but say. They're right to choose you too. The Shizaiden were weapons first and foremost, 
but they were sentient to some degree and thus, had their own will. Itachi and Shisui respected their swords as a legacy of his grandfather, so they didn't force the sword's will to theirs. It's just sad, Itachi said, looking over at his sword that, at last, stopped quivering in its sheath. It would be like turning us against Kanaha. Shisui was rubbing his cheek against Shivien now. Sorry, Shivien I will not force you to do anything you don't want, all right. Naruto sweat dropped. He was happy Shisui loved Shivien that much and did Shivien just purr back. Shisui. It would be a huge handicap, losing their swords. So those are the remaining Shizaiden. Tatsuka Tatara's voice cut his thought off. And all three of them for one team. Naruto didn't blame Tatsuka for shuddering. Mahiro eyed the three swords with stars in her eyes. Those are Miramasasamas. Her eyes hardened. To give out Miramasasamas legacy just like that. She growled. Naruto scowled. Shivien and Tenro chose their owner themselves they've been given the right to wield the Shizaiden because they're worth it. Mahiro. Benitara's voice was hard and the Kunoichi shrank. You're being very rude to them. Then, with a stern voice he ordered, apologize. Mahiro looked like she had been slapped. But. Now. Hide Tada reiterated in a tone that left no room for argument. Her lips trembled as she forced herself to form the word but Naruto didn't let her. Don't, he refused. There is no point in listening to an apology born of an order we will prove our worth, then she can apologize to my friends. With their Shizaiden safely stored inside storage scrolls, Naruto, Itachi, and Shisui stepped into the arena. Standing in a line across the west side of the room which Benitara's team occupied. All of them formed the seal of confrontation, a seal that looked like half ram used as universal sign of engagement between shinobi. Hajimi. As soon as the signal was given, Naruto moved first. Speeding using his Hiko no Fun and passing through between Tatsuka and Benitora. Heh. The Uzumaki didn't attack them. With a poof of smoke two shuriken appeared on his hand, and Naruto threw it in their direction. Tatsuka didn't miss Itachi doing the same from the opposite end. Two shuriken from two directions against a three-man cell? Something is wrong. Mahiro pulled out her own weapon from her waist, a pair of short sword with curved blades that resembled a spider's claw. Don't under. Tatsuka didn't let her to finish as he pulled her hand and jumped to the side with Benny Tora followed closely on his heels. Then a tornado of flame exploded as soon as the two shuriken were within close distance. Benny Tora and his team had to outright run from the whirlpool of flame before it engulfed them. It died down after three seconds and as soon as their back was turned, all of them were locking blades with their respective opponent. Tatara with Itachi. Mahiro with Shisui. And Benny Tora with Naruto. Mahiro had to withdraw from the close contact, the right decision is, at that moment, Shisui activated his Sherry Non. Tatara, on the other hand, chose to avoid eye contact by blowing a seal less kukaku at Itachi. Itachi was shocked to see his clan's signature jutsu used so skillfully by Tatsuka it was only a small fireball around the size of an adult's head but it said a lot regarding Tatsuka's chakra control. How? Hmm. <laughs> Tatsuka had his eyes closed, the older shinobi apparently was capable to fight blind. How did I know your shuriken was a bad news? He quipped. Simple, it was intuition. Their weapons clashed, sparks of fire erupting from the friction. Despite his young age, Naruto-kun is no ordinary shinobi he has the good instincts of a veteran. This man was seriously basing his actions on mere intuition? The basis of Jujuken no Funshuriken's versatility was neither a product of the lack of hand seals nor the speed of, typically slow, nature manipulation that the seal provided, it was simply because the seal was so small and once thrown, unless you had a suitable dojutsu there was no way one could notice it. The shuriken would then burst into an elemental conflagration without warning while initially appearing as a normal shuriken attack. It was very obviously an attack of Naruto's design, holding all the the favored elements of speed, power, and unpredictability. You don't believe me, Itachi Kun. Itachi frowned, his hands went over a series of seals. Katon, Hosunka no Jutsu. Tatsuka pulled a weapon from a hidden pouch on his sleeve accused Aragama. He spun his body clockwise and the blade chain soared to kick the flame-coated shuriken off his tail. 
And also, your side is already on losing side for information, being a part of a prominent shinobi clan means you don't have the luxury of obscurity. It's common knowledge that an Uchiha is generally an all-rounder shinobi, fire-natured and, last but certainly not the least, possessed the notorious dojutsu called the Sherry Nan. Then he cocked his head towards Naruto who was locked in his own battle with Benny Tora. Naruto-kun is a bit tricky though, his mixed ancestry leaves us a broad range of skills he could have inherited, but he is undoubtedly a seal master, and just now, he confirmed our suspicion of his wind affinity. Considering his father's surname, the wind affinity was most likely hereditary. But back to your lack of information on us, it means you will try to get us off guard as soon as possible and now you go as far as engaging us in one-on-one -on -one battles. Because of Kanaha's traditions, a team battle would be far more conventional. Correct, Itachi admitted. You're a very resourceful shinobi, Tatsuka-san. As expected of a shinobi, the shadow ruler kept by his side. Thank you for the compliment. Naruto eyed Benitara's weapon, it was a spear and a traditional weapon of choice for Tokugawa clan. It was not Hokuraku Shimon though, which was a relief. Naruto had attempted to run a number of scenarios in his head on how this battle would go but he'd come up with nothing because they had a grand total of no information on Benitara's team. So they decided to engage in one-on-one -on -one to gain some intel. Not much so far but better than nothing. First was Tatsuka Tatara, obviously the most experienced among the three. He was agile, his chakra control was impressive, most likely a sensor considering he could fight blind, was the brains of the team and he had a fire affinity with a skill at manipulating the element that could make most Uchiha jealous. As for Mahiro. Stay still, bastard. Mahiro roared at Shisui who shunshined away from the barrage of shuriken the kunoichi threw at him. Shisui was laughing. No one is going to listen to that kind of order, even from a pretty lady. Die, Uchiha. Mahiro hissed, biting her thumb to draw blood, forming a series of hand seals before slamming her open palm forward. A seal formula sprung in a portal to another dimension opened. Kuchi Yase, Kumo Sauso. Shisui stopped laughing but then, anyone would when ten spiders the size of your head were jumping at you. Shisui dodged just in time, before the summons swarmed him, with Kawarimi. The spiders swarmed the training log Shisui used as a replacement, their fangs crushing the wood into splinters. There was no doubt if it bit a human, the immediate concern wouldn't be poisoning. Clearly, she was very skilled with shuriken and she also had a summoning contract. Katon, Kukaku no Jutsu. It figures that Shisui would resort to the old, kill it with fire, trick, Uchiha were famed for. Unfortunately, it didn't work as well as he thought it would, as the ten spiders stormed through the massive fireball and straight towards him. Now, Shisui had ten flaming spiders on his heels. Gah. Insects should die when they're on fire. Shisui protested as he threw kunai to pin the spiders to the ground. Note to self, this was high no kuni and the majority of the population had a fire affinity, it was justified to have fire resistant summons. Hey. Spiders are not insects. They're arachnids. Mahiro protested. And Shisui needed a remedial lesson in biology, Naruto noted dryly. Naruto blinked when he saw a puzzled look on Hyde Tada's face, what's arachnid? Spiders aren't insects. Note to self, Hyde Tada was undoubtedly as book dumb as he used to be, and the prince most likely shared the same wavelength as Shisui. Not willing to answer the dumb question, Naruto threw a spinning kick that Benny Tora blocked with the staff of his spear. Naruto smirked, pushing his chakra towards the tenkitsu on his solace, sticking one foot upon the weapon while the other held fast to the ground. What the Benny Tora tried to pull his weapon away but it wouldn't budge. Are you crazy? You can't move while I see a. His hand blurred to form seals. Futon. Like any sensible person who was about to receive elemental attack on the face, he shunshined out of the way and gave up his weapon in the process. Daytapa. Great wind breakthrough. Whoosh. Unsealing another spear from the storage seal in his pocket, Hyde Tada stabbed the blade on the ground to keep his footing. Gah. As expected of an Uzumaki, the amount of chakra he put in this attack would give any normal shinobi severe chakra exhaustion. The attack was mostly harmless given the distance he had put between them but the wind burn alone was enough to disorient him. At least he was not thrown into a wall, 
He mused before a yellow blur promptly slammed into his abdomen and he was sent crashing into the nearest wall. Hide Tadasama. Mahiro cried. Tora kun. Benny Tora coughed, rubbing his throbbing abdomen. That feels like a headbutt from an elephant. Naruto raised an eyebrow at him. Serves you right you're still holding back against me. Then he added with a growl, I am not a child, I am a shinobi. Benny Tora smirked, wiping the blood on his lips. Well, I learned my lesson, so, I will take this seriously now. That was all warning he got before Naruto ended up cursing as his vision was filled with Benny Tora coming towards him from all directions. He tried to pick which shadow was the real one but only at the last moment did he sense the real spear coming towards his side. Naruto parried the spear with his kunai, but he was so focused on the spear that he failed to see the kick from his left. Gah! Naruto received the kick square on his face, barely avoiding a broken nose and was thrown off to the side. He jumped away, and barely noticed blade of the spear coming from his blind spot. This time, he used his hiko no fun and jumped up 20 feet into the air, and stuck to the ceiling. Benny Tora squinted his eyes at the upside down Uzumaki, the pause in their one on one had their teammates deciding to do the same, allowing both teams to regroup. Benitara's team stood on the ground while Naruto's caught up with him on the ceiling. It was a silently agreed break time, with both teams gauging the other now. That jump just now. Tatsuka narrowed his eyes. Not even a shinobi could leap that high, and it looks unnatural. Benny Tora frowned. Unnatural, how? Tatsuka's eyes went towards the spot Naruto had occupied just moments ago. There was no damage even though the chakra enhancement needed to jump that high would usually dent the floor. Well, unless you were Senjutsu Nade, but not even the legendary Medicnin would waste that much effort just for one jump. Not to mention, Naruto was an Uzumaki with a massive chakra capacity thus, no matter how talented, natural chakra control on a Medicnin's caliber was impossible for him. So that left one possibility, a seal. Shisui whistled, his sherry non-reading what Tatsuka whispered to Benny Tora. Naruto, he figured out the Hiko no Fun already. Well, part of it at least. Naruto sighed. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought he was related to the Nara clan. Definitely not, Itachi supplied. His chakra has a different tint to a Nara's. Shisui shrugged. Oh well, at least we have something on them now, so what should we do, Naruto? Naruto contemplated their findings, his eyes narrowed thoughtfully. The arsenals of their opponents were impressive, a weapons mistress with a summoning contract that was resistant to fire to boot and, while Benny Tora was the most powerful fighter in the team in stamina, agility and sheer strength, the most troublesome one was Tatsuka. It's unfortunate for them that we're not stereotypical examples of our clans, don't you think? His lips pulled to a smirk. So let's start with a splash. Any Itachi. He pulled out a small scroll, untying the rope and revealing a seal with kanji for water on the center. The Uchiha air smirked back, right. Naruto exhaled. Fusui hoin, kai. Sudden. His hands blurred a series of seals. Suairi yudan no jutsu. If there was anything they had expected to be coming from Naruto's team, a horde of water dragons followed by a waterfall from the top of their heads was not it. Mahiro's summons shot their threads at one corner of the wall and the Kunoichi escaped the flood and water dragon. Benny Tora and Tatsuka hitched a right each, too, because there was no way they could outrun the torrent pouring from the top of their heads. Mahiro's other summons, except the three they used, dispelled before the water got to them. They panted lightly, eyeing the flooded training area in shock. Where did he get all that water? Benny Tora couldn't help but wonder. Did he seriously store a river's worth of water inside a scroll? Mahiro added. They didn't have time to ponder the mystery as another dragon resurfaced from the water surface, and this time, while Mahiro escaped to the ceiling, her summon was not as lucky as the dragon snatched the summon in its jaw. Water won't kill my summon. Shisui grinned. But this will. Righten, Thunderbolt. The spiders that had floated on the water puffed into smoke, returning to their realm. It was not hard for Tatsuka to figure out what they had done. The water was to ambush Mahiro's summons while giving Shisui a natural lightning conductor at the same time. Not to mention, with the death trap below, their movements were severely restricted. 
This move also eliminated his and Mahiro's katanjutsu. Neither of them had a large chakra capacity so they couldn't win in an elemental battle, not with all the water below. Still. Tatsuka glanced to the left and grinned. Tora-kun. Hide Tada was his master but calling the prince by the nickname made him more agreeable. Make a hole on that wall. Got it. Benny Tora ran on the ceiling towards the mentioned wall. Naruto frowned, what is he? Haya. Benny Tora roared as he rammed his spear into the concrete, creating a large hole, allowing the water to flow out. The Jinshuriki scowled. So that wall leads outside. And most likely to nearest waterway, too. Itachi narrowed his eyes at the older shinobi, they almost forgotten they had one more disadvantage, the opposing team held the advantage of home ground as a guardian, Tatsuka knew the layout of this palace better than anyone else. Let's just try the good old trick, Shisui suggested, forming a Tora seal. Naruto groaned in response. Oh, come on. Naruto cracked one eye open at Itachi who also did the same. Uchiha. He snorted, hi hi he clasped his hands together. Futon. Katon. Then, in unison, they exclaimed, Ninshoha no Jutsu, Blazing Wave. A torrent of flame shot towards them like a tsunami and Mahiro cursed. These kids. Are they trying to kill us? Mahiro slammed her hands to the ground, Doton, Moguragaku or no Jutsu. The ground beneath them turned into fine sand and the trio escaped the wave of flames. Shisui and Itachi exhaled the last of their fire, surveying the damage. Itachi blinked when he noticed a wire, no, a thread thinner than shinobi wire with chakra running through it coming from underground and connected to. Shisui. Your hand. The Shushin expert looked at his hand, his eyes widening at the almost invisible thread coiled around his wrist. What the he was cut off when the thread tugged at his wrist and, as he pulled back, the thread dug into his flesh, drawing blood. Damn it. Shisui tried to cut the thread with a kunai but it wouldn't budge. Mahiro resurfaced, followed by her teammates. You first, Uchiha. Shisui, stay still. Naruto channeled his wind chakra through his own kunai, but the thread remained resistant to imperfect wind blade. Naruto narrowed his eyes as he concentrated, the wind blade thinned and sharpened. It was just one second but the thread, at last, broke. He had no time to relax as hundreds of summoned spiders were thrown at them. Itachi and Shisui grabbed his arms and they jumped back to dodge the assault. To their sherry non, it was like river of spider thread, flowing from Mahiro's body to her summons. If we get caught by that, we're doomed. Shisui hissed as they landed on the ground. They're still summon animals, not to mention they're small, it should be easy to force them to dispel. Itachi pointed out. In that case. His fingers clasped together, ox dragon horse dog bird. Futon, Shogkiha no Jutsu. The shockwave of the wind elemental attack stormed through the horde of spiders, dispelling their summoning. While a spider could ride wind, air pressure was another matter entirely. Naruto perked up, he is coming. He crossed his hands, Kage Bunshin no Jutsu. Chakra smoke burst to existence and as it dissipated ten replica of Naruto appeared. Roger. Itachi and Shisui darted to opposite direction, away from Naruto. He raised his blade, and steel met steel. Benny Tora pushed the blade of his spear forward but Naruto didn't budge. You're really not holding back, if not for your agreement with my Tanuki father I would have thought. You're really trying to kill me. HN, his lips tugged upward slightly, please don't underestimate us, if we wanted you dead, you'd already be so however. He trailed off. We despise violence and bloodshed, which is why we go this far. Something is off, Benny Tora suspected, he could feel it in his gut. Wait, just now he. A few seconds later, an explosion startled Tatsuka and Mahiro from their stalemate with the Uchiha cousins and another dozen of Naruto's clones. Tora could. Tatsuka cried. Benny Tora burst from the cloud of smoke, a little singed but mostly fine. I'm fine. Naruto. On the other hand, not so much. Ugh. As the smoke dissipated, they could see where the Jinchuriki's prone form was. Naruto. Their shocked voice was dampened by the burst of chakra smoke around them, as Naruto's cage bushin were dispelled after the user was knocked out cold. 
Mahiro smirked, it's our win then. Do. Mahiro, W.A., Tatsuko began but he never managed to finish as the world suddenly twisted beneath him and Benny Tora, who was standing beside him, smirked. There was another burst of chakra, bright and warm like the sun to his senses. It wrapped itself around his torso at an unbelievable speed before he could react and slithered down his body to immobilize his limbs. Mahiro yelped in shock as their vision twisted into a surreal world of black and red. The two Uchiha before them exploded into a flock of crows. Kai. Tatsuka quickly returned himself and his team to reality as he utilized his masterful chakra control to dispel the genjutsu without the assistance of a hand seal. However, both he and Mahiro were still bound in golden chains made of shining chakra, and the Uchiha cousins were each holding a kunai against their neck with sherry non blazing. This is it, the young voice of Uzumaki Naruto announced to them from behind, confirming Tatsuka's suspicion that the chakra chain was his. Yield, Tatsuka san, Mahiro san, please. He swallowed, Tora kun. It was Itachi who answered him. Over there, he is fine, mostly. Tatsuka's eyes turned to where he had thought Naruto was knocked out cold. The genjutsu was dispelled now, though, revealing the squirming Benny Tora who had the same chakra chains tying his whole body to the ground. The chain wrapped around their prince and went down into small hole on the concrete floor. Tatsuka could guess where the chain was connected to. Mahiro's eyes were closed, biting her lower lip in frustrated gesture. Tatsuka could tell the kunoichi was frustrated and ashamed beyond words. All right, we yield. It's your win, Naruto-kun, Itachi-kun, Shisui-kun. They deserved this. Ten minutes later. Benitara's team marveled at the fact that, after such an intense fight they had lost, they had ended up only suffering minor injuries which mostly consisted of bruises and shallow cuts. I know this will sound dumb, the prince gritted out. But I still didn't get how we lost. At Naruto's raised eyebrow, he elaborated. I mean, all right, we lost the fight, but I still don't get how that happened. I.e. Yasu who had been watching the fight with amused look interjected. Yes, do enlighten my idiotic son. Benny Tora opened his mouth to retort, but Mahiro beat him to it. You win. But I can't accept you coming at our prince with intent to kill. Shisui rolled his eyes, no one wants to kill anybody, we just made you think so dash. Heh. Tatsuka who was sitting on the ground as cleaning the soot on his arm, sighed loudly. Tora-kun, we have been hoodwinked since the very beginning. He clarified, then waved his hand towards their surroundings. Tell me, does this place look like it just suffered from a massive fire wind enhanced jutsu? There were a number of scorched spots, but nothing that indicated they had a fire jutsu festival. The most glaring evidence was, the wall his team had occupied only had six feet wide blackened surface. The fire Naruto's team had used was at least five times of that so. So all those massive fireballs. Most of them were fakes. Shisui began to explain, there was a fireball attack we threw at you. He glanced at the scorched wall. But even the combined size was not that big we wrapped it in genjutsu so it appeared bigger. Tatsuka's eyes narrowed. Shrouding a real attack in genjutsu, that's like doing two things in the same time. Which is why. Itachi trailed off before continuing. While I supplied the real Gukakyo, Shisui was the one who worked on the illusion while Naruto used a futon so a fireball of that size could reach all the way to another side of the room. A smaller fireball meant a shorter reach so it needed boost of wind. Tatsuka shook his head mirthfully. You guys are really a good team. Still. Mahiro had calmed a great deal after explained that Benny Tora was never in danger of assassination. I can't believe you fooled Tatsuka that easily. Oh, it's very hard even for genjutsu masters like Itachi and me. Shisui admitted with sagely nod. But, since we're Uchiha, you expected genjutsu through eye contact so you didn't notice genjutsu through skin contact. Tatsuka recalled the time he blocked Shisui's punch, it stung because of Raiden but he didn't realize it was also genjutsu. Which is why... I didn't notice Itachi-kun switching place with Naruto-kun to fight Tora-kun. The genjutsu had messed up with his senses. Actually I realized that Naruto was Itachi at the last moment. Benny Tora felt the need to defend his intelligence. He grunted like an Uchiha still. Itachi blinked and Naruto groaned, 
that of all things. Still didn't save me from that sneak attack. The smoke bomb went off and then the chakra chain grabbed his leg. Oh, don't think I forgot. Mahiro apparently was not finished, you dumped a river worth of water on us. She pointed accusingly at Naruto. Who keeps a river inside his storage scroll? We passed by a flooded village on our way back from a mission, so. Naruto trailed off. Unless Itachi is going to turn into the Nidaima's second coming soon, it's handy to keep water source around. He explained his logic on why he had a river on storage scroll. Besides, while throwing so much destruction around Izumaki style, no one would look hard for Genjutsu. Tatsuka had to admit, after that flood over his head, he let his guard down on Genjutsu and watched out for another disaster-esque jutsu the team would throw at them instead. That was masterful deception at its finest, concocted by a group of young shinobi no less. Your teamwork is flawless, Tatsuka couldn't help but comment. No, they're full of flaws, i.e. Yasu corrected, startling all shinobi around him. He had been pretty quiet as both teams were reviewing their performance. Your strategy in this fight came with high risks, especially the last move. If Uchiha Itachi failed to keep Hyde Tada occupied until the right time, if Tatsuka noticed Naruto's chakra in spite of all distraction Uchiha Shisui provided. He listed on. What would you do if you failed? Naruto just smiled at that. We didn't fail in the end, and while I agree our plan was risky and more likely to fail in your opinion, he tilted his head to the side, I trust Itachi and Shisui with my life, don't you think trusting them to make my crazy plan work is nothing in comparison? He said it as if it was the simplest thing in the world, typical of Naruto. Itachi and Shisui couldn't stop themselves from laughing, though in Itachi's case it was nothing more than a string of chuckles. Shisui outright guffawed until his sides hurt. What? It's a simple logic. Naruto said, pouting at his teammates and best friends. No no. Shisui coughed, only you would answer like that when someone is questioning your sanity. He coughed again, poorly hiding his laughing fit. It's so you, though. What's that so wa? Naruto yelped when a calloused hand landed on top of his head. He was still recovering from his use of chakra chains which he shouldn't use so much and Karama was still screaming inside his mind about healing his chakra coils again. So he was in no condition to dodge. I.e. Yasu ruffled Naruto's blonde locks. Really? I have asked so many shinobi the same question when I pointed flaws in their teamwork, strategy, and tactics, but he exhaled softly. Only you and your grandfather answered it, not with a logical answer or excuse. But with the simple fact that they had absolute trust in their comrades, no other reason was needed. Then suddenly, I.E. Yasu turned his attention to his teammates, giving them a look that alarmed Naruto. It was not fear and suspicion like what he saw from villagers of Kanaha, but, it was sympathy. I.E. Yasu then knelt beside him so he was on the same eye level as Naruto who was sitting on the floor. Naruto could. His hand was still on the top of Naruto's head. Then Naruto heard it, a whisper that rang through his mind. It was not Karama's voice, but I.E. Yasu's. We need to talk Naruto kun. About you. Your family, the Namikaze and the Uchiha clan. Those words heralded the second time his world shattered since the day he learned about his Jinchuriki status and its associated, classified information. Apparently he had not discovered enough dark secrets, the legacy of his family. That's it for part 6. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.